Hello, everybody. Happy Saturday to you all. I'm thrilled to announce that that 64 Vox JMI AC4 is finally done. We had a situation where the speaker provide the replacement speaker provided by the owner uh, was not particularly very good. I will not call out that brand that let us down, but it's got a warehouse W, uh, sorry G. 8A Alnico 8 inch 4 ohm in there now, and it is quite happy. So maybe later I'll show you the tremolo on that thing. Let's get started with everything. Uh, hey, Rax Effects, thank you very much for that. Uh, let's see, let me put this up on screen. Let me remember to do things like that. Oh, yeah, the Corso is a great amp. I mean, I understand why it may not have taken off in the market and that it's kind of a relatively expensive low wattage amp done in mid-century modern you know uh, furniture style so it's not something that most people are going to want to gig with etc cetera, etc cetera. but um it's a wonderful sounding wonderfully built reliable little tone monster um so yeah just if you gig with it live baby it because it is you know done like an eames lounge chair let's see what else have i missed here Apparently, there are some comments and possibly super chats put up uh, before I started the stream. Sorry about the autofocus thing there. Um, um, uh, I don't see them. So anyone who has a question that for me that's before uh, Joe Blog saying VV, which I guess is variable voltage, uh, repost if, if it's for me. Um, if, it's, if it's a... Uh, a super chat just ask the question but I do thank you I just I can't see them on the screen back when I was using OBS I was seeing the YouTube feed directly but I could not put things easily up on the, uh, the screen here for you guys so I am learning all this new stuff and trying to get to know how things work and all that fun stuff and uh, I will try to uh, keep improving but it's really hard for me right now to see uh, anything that was uh, posted before the the stream actually starts. <coughs> uh, let's see here. Hey, Richard. I am constantly... I've been trying to do the Amps Under 2000 Part 1 video for the last six-plus months. And between, you know, what happens is I'll get really busy with stuff and, you know, I'll do a whole bunch of research getting ready to do that and then I'll get a whole bunch of stuff and then I need to get done. And I come back to the research and a lot of my research is no longer ap applicable because the market has been changing so much. Prices have been going around and around and around so much. It's really, really hard to uh, kind of nail down what is and is not an amp under $2,000 these days. But I will be getting to that. I'm going to be breaking that series into two parts because there's so many amps under 2,000. So I'm going to do kind of like the first one's going to be like traditional amps, you know, and that mostly one channel amps. You know, Fenders, they have two channels, but they're the same thing. Uh, a Marshall has two channels, you know, old Marshall. But, you know, like a, a Fender, a Marshall, and that's going to be a lot of different genres. So clean, country, hard rock, et cetera, et cetera. And then a second video for the multi-function, multi-channel effects loop, three channels, MIDI, blah, 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 options out there. Because the guy looking, um, trying to decide between Top Hat and Dr. Z isn't going to really care about a Bogner, Ubershaw, or whatever, though I don't think that's a $2,000 amp. Anyway, uh, the point being, I'm going to try to make it so players looking for a certain kind of amp are going to see apples to other apples. Hey, Gringo Pig, I am well. Let's see. Justin, I'm sorry if I missed your question last week. I tried to get to all of them, but it, it, there are an awful lot of questions, for which I'm grateful. Um, let's see here if I can make this a little bit smaller. It's very complicated in that power scaling can be done poorly and can be done well. 
is most easily implemented in a cathode bias stamp, where you can just scale everything together, uh, where you don't have to think about it too much. When you do introduce uh, power scaling, variable voltage, whatever avoids the trademarks in the nomenclature, um, into a fixed bias amp, you've got to scale the negative bias supply at the same time, and that can be done well. It rarely is. There are other considerations. Some people prefer to scale the entire circuit. Others will say, I'm just going to fail, uh, scale um, everything up to the PI. So that's the output tubes and the screens and the phase inverter. So everything within the negative feedback loop is scaled. Other, pe other people will just scale the screens. Other people will just scale the output uh, tube plates. The issue then is unless you've uh, put in some clamping circuits, as you lower the B plus draw, uh, given to just say the plates and screens, there's more current uh, or less current being drawn by that. So the B plus goes up for the preamp section. Um, as the current draw goes down, the voltage increases, and so you're decreasing the voltage to the output section, but your preamp voltage can go up quite a bit and really change the, the behavior. So then you're introducing a way to uh, say that the preamp voltage must never exceed X. And every time you're limiting voltage or losing voltage here or there, you're introducing heat. And every time you do this, you're introducing complexity and more things that can fail. So while it is possible to do very well, in my experience, most of the time, it is a very complicated over solution to one problem, which can introduce other problems. So at some point, a combination of maybe a little bit of power scaling or a very good master volume impl implementation or both or very good master volume and external uh, uh, attenuation. Uh, some combination of factors where no one thing is doing all the heavy lifting. Um, I have applied variable voltage with great success to many cathode biased amps, but of those, two or three, uh, the circuit has failed due to heat, and that's with very good quality components, heat synced properly to the chassis. It's just uh, heat is introduced, and I'm increasingly wary of such things um, when you start doing this, and I've certainly been guilty of this, you get a kind of a gee whiz, wouldn't it be cool if we did this, wouldn't it be cool if we do that approach? And as you get older and grumpier and uh, don't like having to um, admit, you know, hey, that, that didn't work as well as I hoped, let me fix that for you, that's not a great place to be. The best results that you can get with simplicity are what I increasingly strongly believe in. So if you have a 50 watt amp and you are playing gigs where you're constantly, constantly either attenuating it or power scaling it down or turning the master way, way down, you might really be better off with a 20 watt amp. I'd rather have a 20 watt amp where I have the master volume at two o'clock than a 50 watt amp where the master volumes at 10 o'clock or a 100 watt amp with the master volumes at 830. Um, you know, the right tool for the right job. Um, not everyone's going to have multiple amps for multiple gigs. I get that and flexibility is great. I would say that as far as flexibility, um, reliability, less intrusive into the circuit, a well implemented master volume is often a better choice. There are tonal trade-offs with any approach. There is no free lunch. Uh, and if you need a 20 watt amp, the best thing to do is to have a 20 watt amp. Not make your 100 watt magically 20 watts. Hey, Tasty Tone. Yeah, the Schultz Power Soak uh, is not a reliable circuit. Um, it is, uh, what's the best way to put this? Given what was available in the 80s, it wasn't, was not an unreasonable choice, but it has great potential to kill your output transformer and your tubes, and it's not really worth 
the risk because it doesn't sound very good either. It's a non-reactive load. Um, if you really, really need a load box, look at Sir, look at uh, Fryette, look at Friedman. Uh, there are very good ones out there. Maybe the Ox box that Universal Audio has would suit your needs, though I have concerns about its long-term safety for amps. <clears throat> but the Schultzes, the Marshalls, uh, many, many of these devices are just resistors in a box without adequate cooling. And uh, it only takes one little thing, especially in a 40-year-old circuit, to go wrong and then kablooey. So be very, very careful. Um, if something costs less, there is a reason. Um, the THD hot plate is about as cheap as I would go. It's not a cheap as in poor quality. It's, it's just less expensive than some of the newer ones. But there are reasons that, that Sir and Fryat, et cetera, have reinvented that wheel and, and made improvements since the 1980s. If the, if the uh, power soak circuit or the THD hot plate was really the end-all be-all, there'd be no need to continue to innovate. Uh, these guys don't make something just to have a box out there with their name on it. They want to have a box that d meets something, a need that their clients have had that nothing else on the market has quite met. And if, if there's some overlap in what Sir and Fryat and Friedman are doing, well, they're all going to have a different take on it. But it's not just to have their thing, too. Uh... It looks interesting from the outside. I've not seen anything on the inside. And people have said great things about the JVM. And the inside of the JVM is garbage. And the output section of the JVM is garbage. Until I see the JTM20 uh, in person, I'm not going to have any opinion pro or con. Uh, I know that, with all respect to Pete, I could send him something which did not sound particularly good. And given the way he plays and the way it, he, he records things, it would sound good for a demo. It would sound really good. Um, I notice he has not stopped using his Sur amps. So um, I'd, I'd want to see what's inside a JTM20 before I yayed or nade it. Um, but I noticed that a lot of the channels got the JTM20s on the same day. And uh, it always... Makes my spidey sense tingle. Thank you, Robert. Appreciate that. Welcome to everybody. Whether I call you out by name or not, you are all welcome, and I'm glad to see all of you. Thank you very much. Hopefully we got that sync problem out of the way from last week. That was really embarrassing. I had done so many test videos, live streams that were private that no one else could see beforehand, and they were all fine. Then I went live and like Nathan from the jerk. Uh, hey, Dennis from Chicago. Hey, Jeremy, thank you very much. I have not used the VHT D50. I will say, uh, and I don't know uh, where in the VHT history the, DH, the D50 falls. I will say that there is a very big difference between VHT when Steve Fryat was running the show and the VHTs I've seen since the uh, brand was sold. So I am not a fan of the VHTs that I've had come in uh, that, since the parting of the Fryat ways. Uh, I think if you want the sound and quality of the old VHT, you need to go with Fryat. Um, but I have not... I don't think I've uh, had the D50 on my bench. I think the only two I've had have been the same model. It's an 18-watt thing. And it was just built out of tissue paper and used sneezes. Uh, that's one of the newer ones. That's not a, a classic VHT from the Fryat era. I hope that doesn't burst too many bubbles, but I have to have to speak truth to power amps. Robert, you are absolutely correct. It is insane. It is. I think it is an EU safety regulation where you must be unable to burn yourself or children must be unable to burn themselves uh, from touching the back of an app. 
It's not necessarily a new thing. I've just returned to the owner a 90s Korg AC15 TB. And it had that stupid plate over all the tubes, held on by six screws. And because the way the whole thing was put together, there's no way you could change a tube on a gig. You would have to remove the entire chassis, remove this cage to access the tubes. If it were my amp, I would leave that plate off entirely. But then you'd still be reaching around behind you, trying to feel where the tubes are because you couldn't see them. Uh, it's discouraging because a lot of times it just, you know, people are going to find ways to hurt themselves. And I'll, I'll tell you, having, you know, being a father and having had young children, there are things you do to protect your kids at all costs. And there are situations where you know that, well, if they were to touch this, it would hurt. It would not permanently maim them. That It would be safe. We all learned that way. They would not touch those, such things again. So if that sounds like bad parenting, you know, I'm not saying give your kid a fork and show, uh, point them out towards to the outlets. But, you know, you can tell a kid a stove is hot. They won't believe you until they touch it. I think uh, some of the tube cage things are a bit, uh, a bit over the top. Hey, Dr. Dave, thank you very much. Uh, kind of on the heels of what I was saying before, I have not used the ox. I have not opened the ox up. I don't know what's inside the ox. Uh, I see a lot of people using it with great results. And a lot of people who could afford other things are using it with great results. I have heard things from some texts that I admire that cast doubt on its safety uh, with all amps given a long period of time. But those techs, I happen to know, are also in the industry and are involved with competitors' products. So I'm not saying that they're... Uh, uh, stretching the truth. I don't, I'm not saying that they're disparaging a, a wonderful thing. I'm not saying that they are lying. Uh, and I'm not saying that they're wrong. I don't know. And I'm not here to speak for them in public. And I don't want to say anything good or bad about the ox other than from what I've seen and heard. It seems to be a wonderful tool if it is as safe as people claim. But as I have not had one in, on my bench to take apart and s see what makes it tick and know how it's going to react um, to different signals and what kind of loads it provides, I don't recommend it to clients myself because I cannot be sure that it is entirely safe. I do say, hey, you can check this out. People have great results. Um, I would ask some guys deeper in the industry than I am about it before you trust your $3,000 amp to this $1,400 box. Uh, okay, this one scrolls in a different way than the YouTube one scrolls. Okay, cool. Uh, I think you've just been lucky. Um, the issue is that I know that they can cause flyback voltages. Um, I don't want to get too far into it. I don't want this to be just the attenuation chat because it's not something that most of my clients use, and I don't think it's something that everyone wants. And I, It puts me in a spot where I, if... You know, this is, to explain these things, I would need a whiteboard, and I would need uh, to schedule. A, we're going to chat a, just about nothing but attenuators today. And so if I go too deep, people, other people will tune out, but I don't think I would really be able to convey uh, anything that meaningful other than I personally would not recommend a power soak to any of my clients because it is an old device components in their wear out. It was never a great design, and there are known situations where it can cause damage. So I would say, yes, you've been lucky. This is one of the things that it's difficult to do as a tech on YouTube in that you'll say, hey, this, this model of amp has got serious, serious flaws, and I've had 
40 of them in the last five years, and they all have the same problem. And here comes Bubba saying, I ain't never had no problem with mine. This guy don't know what he's talking about. Congratulations, Bubba. That is what's called a statistically meaningless sample size. But I'm glad that it's been statistically meaningless in your favor. I'm not calling you Bubba there, Tasty Tone, but I think you might be a little bit luckier than you know. Thanks, Rogue One. Appreciate that, and I'm glad that you dodged that over, overpriced, underbuilt bullet. Hey, thank you, Brendan. Appreciate that. Um, it's really going to depend, depend on the sounds you're trying to get and the wattages you're playing at. Um, open back and, and closed back are very different things. Closed back, unless you have a very expensive cab, is going to sound kind of boxy in a 1x12. But you'll, if you're standing directly in front of it, you'll hear it very well. A 1x12 traditionally is open backed and has a lot of spill so um, you can hear it from the sides better so your drummer if you're next to your drummer your drummer hears you better um, there's so much into that and then what kinds of sounds are you after are you a fan of of country good are you playing country are you playing uh, you know 60s rock hard rock are you playing jazz are you playing metal uh, I don't think there's one answer to that um, I'm, I'm sorry to be vague, but if you could ask a follow-up and tell me more about the sounds you're going for, I might be able to help you better. That's a, not, a, not a stupid question at all. It's a very good question. Because Fender was not selling you an app for guitar. Fender was selling you an amplifier for anything that pr primarily they could sell you to plug into it or any, anything else you might want to plug into it. So different devices have different amplification needs. So the pickups that people would put in their accordions might need more, more or less gain than your guitar. And hopefully, from Leo's point of view, as a Fender guitar. If Leo was sending you, selling you an electric piano, that would have a different impedance and need different gain than your guitar. A lot of microphones at the time were just unbalanced quarter inches plugged into the same app, so you'd be playing guitar and singing through the same amplifier, and you would need more or less gain depending on the, the signal source. Um, there were also guitars with very, very weak pickups, and there were guitars with very, very hot pickups. And Leo and the guys did not know what you were actually using. Uh, so it was built to accommodate a lot of stuff, which worked out very well for us because we can turn it up and get a lot of overdrive that Leo never intended. What's really interesting to me, let me get a sip of coffee before this, is have you ever played a 50s Gibson Les Paul amp? I've got a GA40. I've got two GA40s here to to get to. But the Les Paul amp would guarantee that you would never ever sound like a Les Paul record, no matter what you did, because the thing has gotten an insane amount of gain, almost no headroom. You cannot get that clean, direct, jazzy sound that, that, that Les was always getting. I have no idea, unless he just took the check to have his name slapped on it. I, I can't imagine he ever used one. There's no way to sound like Les Paul through that but you can sound like a little old Ben from Texas. Uh, if you're in New York City, uh, more than just the moniker, it can be worth it. I know Jim Capolongo, I think he's your neighbor in, in Queens or Brooklyn, and he plays a Princeton in his little apartment. But he's not going to be turning that thing over maybe two. And uh, he plays really, really well. So if his neighbors hear him at all, they might actually enjoy, the pro enjoy it. So it you know, it's going to depend on whether your neighbors want any kind of free concert and if you're the, the kind of act that they like. But you know, I've demonstrated 
here on the channel before with Deluxe Reaper issues and AC-15 Customs. And if you turn them down, they work very well as practice amps. I could, I, my point in that video was that I was able to hear myself in the room and get a very nice sound. And the microphone on the app picked it up just great and the recording was wonderful. But having, like I said, I'm a parent, I, I've got kids. I could have had my guitar playing at that volume with a sleeping child in the other room. I used to live in an apartment. I could have played at that volume and the neighbors would not have heard it because it was lower than the volume of the average television. So yes, you can. That said, there is a great, the, 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 let me rephrase this, the digital stuff today offers tremendous opportunities for people in your situation. I am surrounded by amps here. I have every amp under the sun. <coughs> I also have a pretty powerful Mac system here for doing the channel and the video editing and the streaming running Logic. And I, I put that new um, plugin that Neural DSP has out. It's a free plugin. And I downloaded from their uh, the group of people t sharing IRs and, and impulses and all that stuff. Uh, someone's AC-15. And uh, late at night when my wife is asleep, I'll put these headphones on. And I think I've timed it. I've got three milliseconds round trip delay. And so any of these guitars through a pretty good um, model of an AC-15 headphones, no one hears it but me. Um, I'd be a fool to say, no, all that stuff is garbage. Got to go tube amp, tube amp, tube amp. I think tube amps still sound and feel better at real volumes. But for practice, and again, in that uh, those two bedroom amp videos I did, I still pointed out that my favorite bedroom amp, practice amp, is an acoustic. That 335 not plugged in is kind of nice too. Joe blogs for amps over 5K. Hire me. I will give you a private consultation since you've got the budget. Not really. Uh, sorry, Teal Static. Uh, I, I, should, I suppose I should read these questions for those who are listening rather than watching. Uh, Teal Static asks, is there any way to test tubes with a multimeter? You can check for sh d dead shorts, but... Um, other than a dead short situation, you're not going to get anything meaningful with a, with a multimeter. Tube testers measure an awful lot more than just that. Um, there's a lot. In most, amp, most tube amps, when something goes wrong, it's the tubes. In a mesa that goes wrong like that, it's usually the mesa. Uh, there's just so much that could possibly be going off, going wrong in that mesa. But hopefully, for your sake, it's just tubes. But... Uh, uh, I, I don't remember off the top of my head which tubes a DC-2 takes. Sometimes the best option is just to have known good spare tubes on hand because most people have no reason to, to buy a, a tube tester unless you just do this all the time. Hey, Klaus, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Everyone is welcome. I'll just try to randomly include people here as possible. Clyde Broadway. All right. A favorite alternative for super high gain Mesa at bedroom volume, any price. I'll go full circle. Uh, let's see, this MacBook Pro here cost me $2,800. This Motu M2 cost me about $180. These headphones are about $150. I've got some powered Yamaha monitors, $800 almost, um, with stands. I would say get a MacBook Air, probably about $900 for, for an M1 these days. Use GarageBand, install the Neural DSP plugin or install the Waves uh, plugins and uh, get some real headphones versus the, the uh, AirPod nonsense, but you can get some pretty good headphones for 50 to $100 these days. 
and plug them into your uh, and you just need a, a, a dongle. Uh, well, actually, you do need a, you need an external uh, power converter, and the Mo2 is probably about as good as you're going to get uh, without spending an awful lot. The Mo2 M2, I think they have an M1 as well, but the M2 you wouldn't outgrow. But you can probably find like a used Focusrite 2i2 second gen for 75 bucks, and you could just thrash to your heart's content and no one would hear you. And you could write on it, and you could have drums and keyboards and all kinds of stuff. Do an entire record on there. Um, it's amazing what you can do with all the tools today. And whether that the right tool for you is a MacBook, or whether the right tool for you is a 64 AC4, or um, let's see right there, I've got a car Skylark. I've got um, a couple AC30s here. I've got a ProSonic there. I've got a Super Reverb reissue there. I've got a Silvertone back there. Somewhere around here is that a... Uh, is that, uh, What's one from the other day that I like so much? Um, I'm pulling a Mitch McConnell. What was that amp the other day that I liked so much? Sorry, Brian, the, the top hat. So I've got all these, sorry, I'm going off on tangents. Um, I've got all these great amps here I could play through. But it'd be foolish of me not to also recognize the other creative tools available. So it's going to depend on uh, your, your personality and your, your uh, ability to deal with different tools. But at the end of the day, it comes down to your creativity and your musicianship. And that's just how it works. Hey, I've never. Hey, Matt, I've never been contacted uh, by anyone about uh, uh, re redoing those pedals or licensing the designs. It's in the back of my mind, but I've just been too busy to pursue it. So, you know, um, I'd like them to be out there, but I don't want to to hand make each one ever again. It was an awful lot of work for very little money, and um, I was mu I'm much more popular in in my absence in that market than I ever was when I was trying to be present in it. Subro, thanks for joining us, man. I'm glad you made it. Second, I'm trying to get a hand, handle on how some of this stuff works. All right, here we go, here's a good one. Mr. Subro Pontes, he finally got a 64 Top Boost AC30 after playing a C2X for years. Should I be extra cautious about temperature due to the super small vents and any tips to keep it cool for long sessions? Yeah, um, I would need to know what country you're in. Um, JMIs are weird, wonderful things. And I'm trying to decide how much how far down in this particular rabbit hole to go? I'm, I'm going to do the uh, for dummies version, not because any of you are dummies, just because it it, it gets the point across. When JMI uh, spec'd out the transformers that they wanted to use, or or uh, I don't know whether they spec them out and had Woden and uh, Albion et cetera build them, or whether they were choosing from Woden and Albion's catalog, and the mistake was. Uh, Woden's, I don't know, uh, et cetera. But in the UK, not only are they on 240 volt versus 100, let's call it 120 here, though back in the 60s it was 110 and closer to 220. They're also on a 50 hertz power. We're on a 60 hertz power. So when those power transformers were spec'd out, uh, I believe the tap says 110 for US use. That was... 110 at 50 hertz, but we have 60 hertz. So a lot of US boxes are run set to 110, but the transformer is running much hotter than it was designed to run 
because it's getting 60 hertz power rather than 50 hertz. And that's one of the reasons that you see puddles of wax on those slider boards. There are ways around that, uh, primarily decreasing the, um, the incoming AC. Uh, and you, basically, you want to get the, the heaters running about 6 to 6.3 volts AC, no more. And then you know that um, the power transformer is performing the way it was designed to do. But that same thing has happened uh, to a, for a different reason in the, Europe and a lot of the other countries that are on 220, 240. Um, you know, I, know, I know in Australia, the wall voltage is supposed to be 240, it exceeds 255. You do not want to be giving that thing more uh, wall voltage than it's rated for. I know in, in Europe you can do a trick where you are giving it 220, but you, you know, nominally 220, but you set the transformer tapped to 240. Where's the 230? I have to look. I've got the big book over there, but I'm just gonna. There are two options for U European use. You you feed it a lower voltage, but you set it to the higher one, it helps it run cooler. Um, so that you can do it with the Variac, you can do it with the brown box, you can do it with the, with the offset like that. Though with any old JMI, those voltage selectors are very fragile. I usually have people choose a country to use it in, and let me hardwire it to that voltage. Leave it the switch check mounted for external cosmetics, but it was fragile in 1964 and it's really exceedingly fragile today. Um, the other issue is make sure that once you have it operating at the correct mains voltage, make sure that the bias is correct because uh, resistors can drift. You want the bias at idle to not exceed 14 watts and not be lower than 12 watts. So 12 to 14 watts is the bias range. Beyond that, people uh, often run fans on them. I have not found it as necessary to run fans on them once the first two issues, the, the voltage, and, uh, the mains voltage and the bias are addressed, but it can't hurt. That's the short version of the answer. <sighs> Let's see here. Uh, you wuss. I don't get headaches if I don't have coffee in the morning. I just don't wake up. Speaking of which, thank you very much, love. Which one is this? Whichever one you want to start with from. Oh, I thought this was one of them. No. Okay, we'll do that later. Okay. Thank you. Mmm, this pot's better than the last cup pot. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Jeremy, did I answer your question about the uh, VHT D50 earlier, or is this some? Or was this two people asking about the D D50? I imagine that's you. I haven't. Heard, I've never had anyone ask me about a D50 before. So, um, do me a favor, everyone. If you think I haven't gotten to your question, don't ask it again because I'll probably will answer it and then I'll see it a second time and forget if it was to you that I was answering it. Help her brother out here. Um, but if I didn't see your question because you posted it before I started the live stream officially at one o'clock, do repost. Dr. Dave says, I, th I have a hand-wired Princeton 64 reissue. I think you mentioned these were not built well. Are these worth upgrading or better to sell? Thanks. Much better to sell because uh, they're overpriced and people love them because all the YouTube channels tell you they're great and people want them. So sell it, make some money uh, for the price of, of that hand-wired 64 Princeton. You could get that car Skylark. You could get that top hat uh, Club Royale. Both, both much better amps. My vote would be for the top hat, but you're in a... You, for the price of the hand-wired 64 Deluxe in Princeton, you could actually buy a real amplifier made by a real person with real hands and real ears. I'm not coming down on you, Dr. Dave. That look was for all the people watching the stream later who might need to hear such things.
Uh, Robert Israel says, would a post-phase inverter master volume be better on a 64 Vibro reverb than an attenuator? I use an Ericom PRX150 DAG attenuator currently. I'm not, not familiar with, with that attenuator. Um, I have never... What's the best way to put this? Vibro verb's a pretty clean app. Why would you need to turn the preamp up and then attenuate the output unless you're just really pushing that preamp pretty hard? Um, there's not going to be much breakup in the output section of, of a vibro verb. The preamp, the preamp will give you breakup long before the output section will. So yeah, a, a, a good, a well-implemented post-phase inverter master volume will be fairly transparent on a 64 vibro verb. Hell, you could implement the 70s master volume where the two mix resistors come in to the master volume pot, which just feeds the input of the phase inverter, and you still get very good results. Um, you can get distortion from 60s fenders. Most of the distortion you're going to get from those amps is uh, is in the uh, preamp because the phase inverter is a 12 AT7. It's all in a negative feedback loop and it's got six L6s in, in the case of the, of the vibro verb. Um, everything there wants to stay clean and there's no saturation in the output transformer of, of a vibro verb. A little bit more potentially than with a twin, but it's not like a vibro lux. <sighs> You might like the sound of the attenuator better. I would say that as far as reliability, uh, the master volume is a better option. And you might not hear much of a difference. One, either way, you're not going to be driving the speaker as much. And that's, that's where you real, will hear a difference. <clears throat> Anything which lowers the output level of the amplifier will, will move less air into the speaker. And this is something I, I try to get across to people. When people talk about, is it transparent? Is it transparent? Our ears preclude transparency. We hear within a certain frequency range much better than anything else. It's called the Fletcher Munson curve. So if something's up loud, we hear everything. As you turn it down, we are much more sensitive to the frequencies within the, the band used by human speech than the really high stuff and the really low stuff. So as you turn it down, you begin to lose lows, you begin to lose highs, you still hear the mids because that's what we need to hear as a species. Um, our brains are just wired that way. And that's why as you turn things down, you begin, it sounds less exciting or it can sound midi. Um, there's also just the physics that the speaker is moving much less. Um, and it's gonna be harder to make the speaker move at low volumes unless you have a very efficient speaker. So once you get it below a certain level of attenuation, whether that's a master volume or an, a, a speaker load attenuator or whatever, there are going to be changes that we hear due to physics and the way our ears work that you cannot magically undo with electronics. That's why stereos used to have a loudness button. Maybe they, they still do I haven't had a stereo in years, but that loudness button just boosts the highs and lows at lower volumes, which brings back kind of, sort of, the balance of highs to mids to lows we'd hear if the volume on the app was up higher. Of course, people being people, they would have the, the amp loud, the stereo loud, and then hit loudness as well and get a big bass boost and a big treble boost. Uh, sound, man, what you going to do? Hey, Boston guitarist, I have worked on a triple X. Um... I don't think it's a particularly high quality amp, but I don't think it's um, terrible. Uh, given what it does, $400 seems reasonable to me as long as it doesn't have any issues and isn't gonna cost you another $400 to get fixed within six months. Unless I could see that particular example, I can't give you more advice than that. But um, uh, I would say you're calling a PV triple X a poor man's rectifier is not any worse built than a, rectif the, the Mesa dual rectifier. The rectifier is a poor man's Saldano. The rectifier is a ripoff of the Saldano. The 5150 is a ripoff of the Saldano. The 5150 is perceived as a step down from the dual rec. The triple X is perceived as a step down from the 5150 or the uh, 
What's what's the one that they called it? Sixty twenty five, whatever they called it after Van Halen uh, left the PV contract. Anyway, all those apps. There's not a huge quality difference between a fifty one fifty and a uh, and a dual rectifier. They're all a huge, huge jump off the cliff, lower down than the Soldano that they're all copying. But four hundred bucks for a triple X, you know, it's it's really loud. It's got a whole bunch of options. If it's working well, go for it. Four hundred bucks, cool. Thank you, Martin. I appreciate that very much. And Martin, you'll appreciate this. My wife and I watch Vera on BBC America or whatever it is. And uh, that's set in Northumberland around, uh, around uh, Newcastle. And while Newcastle is, as you know, not Scotland, well, I don't have to tell you, Martin, but for the rest of you, um, a lot of the customs and languages, and uh, not language, but dialects and, and terms that far north of England uh, on the northeast shore uh, have a lot of overlap with Scotland. So I'm constantly translating for my wife because they'll have, we'll have the subtitles on and she won't understand what the hell they're saying verbally. And then she reads it and says, I still don't know what that is. So we had a nice chat about Bairns the other day. Well, Richard, if you turn the volume down before the power tubes, the power tubes are not going to drive and sag. That said, power tubes in most amplifiers don't really drive and sag as much as you think. Um, a lot of what you attribute to power tube drive and sag is really what your ears are doing when you're hearing something over 90 dB. Our ears compress. Our ears add distortion to things. So when something is very, very loud, we like that. And as you turn the volume down, we're hearing it linearly and we're not, our ears and brain aren't distorting. Our, well, it's physically the ears start to distort, but the, how the nerves uh, translate that. So it's less exciting to us. And so you're always going to prefer the louder thing. And if you think that the louder thing is being caused by um, one factor, it can actually be a different factor. But um, go back to my earlier statement. Um, in general, if you're constantly turning down your 50 watt amp, you may need to get a 15 or 20 watt amp. Hey, Green Calcs, Michael Hurwitz, thank you. Hey, Gary McKinney, he says, I was just wondering if you had any tone capacitor recommendations for an AB763 build. Love your videos, by the way. Thank you very much, Gary. There is a lot of hokum out there about different kinds of capacitors and, and you know, which ones sound the best, which ones have the magic, which ones kind of make you sound like it's the real deal. I have said this before, and I think people take it as a joke, but it's it's the truth. No one ever got rich selling metronomes, and yet that will make you a better player. People will sell the hell out of toneful capacitors, but it won't do anything for anyone's play. Now, in an amplifier, it's not anywhere near the nonsense people get with guitar capacitors, with paper and oil, and, and oh, this one's from the Soviet era and oh this is a 50s one and it's wax and it's gr there's a whole bunch of bullshit associated with uh how to wire a guitar in an amplifier there are actual factors which make can come into play so the bumblebee uh that might be uh, a 50 dollar waste of your money in a guitar is actually safe in a guitar an old bumblebee is not going to be safe in a, in a guitar amp with this voltage when I choose a tone capacitor for an amplifier, the first thing I look at is how is the capacitor mounted? Is it a little uh, radial box cap uh, that's going to go on a PCB? Well, I'll measure it. Okay, that's the 75 millimeter hole spacing. And I can go uh, one and a half millimeters wide and 10 millimeters long. All right, and the hole diameter is point whatever. So 
first of all, that's what I need. I'm not putting an orange drop in there. Well, the original was a 400 volt. I can get this five. I can get the 630 volt. I'm gonna get the 630 volt. It's gonna cost three cents more. That more longevity. Beyond that, I can get this one that's uh, polypropylene, or I can get this one that's polyester. Well, this is a, a Marshall style circuit. Marshall's had polyesters. I'll use the polyester, and then I'll look at availability and price, and say, oh, okay, I can go with this Epcos, or I can go with this Wema. Well, the Wema costs less, and I know that they're not going to be out of stock on this. I'll use, I'll get the Wemas. That's the extent of that conversation. When it comes to a fender, most people are going to say use an orange drop. An orange drop is a radial design, and those boards, those old eyelet boards are set up for axial caps. So the first thing you do, sticking an orange drop on an axial board, is you bend, make a sharp crimp, uh, turn in the lead that often breaks the epoxy seal. Doesn't always, and it's not always immediately a bad thing when you do that, but all right, so you've got a really sharp turn right where the lead exits the cap body. You might break the seal on the coating, might let in moisture, and then you solder it to the, to the board because everyone told you to use an orange drop, and specifically they told you to get the big polypropylene 716 piece, even though the 220s and the 418s sound better. Those are the polyester ones. Well, now you've got this honking big mass of orange stuff supported by little spindly wires. And uh, every time that board flexes, it vibrates, puts stress on things. It's really not the right cap for that. So I look at what axial caps are available. And I could say, all right, well, for this amp, I could use an MKT, uh, I could use a, a Mallory 150M. I could use an MKT 1813. I could use. Um, a Jupiter, or I could use a Synergy, or I could use a Sozo, or I could use an IC, or I could use these uh, uh, Mojo Tone Dijons. And people will write reams on all the online forums about why this one's great and this one's terrible, this one's great, this one's terrible. At the end of the day, they all sound pretty much the same. Once you get beyond a certain quality point, um, even the IC yellow ones that are sold fairly cheaply are, are quite good. Uh, you get diminishing returns. You know, you, the difference between a 30 cent cap and a 75 cent cap is huge in terms of quality. And sometimes that correlates into, into sound. The difference between a 75 cent cap and a dollar cap is, is not m that much. And then you get into the synergies and the Jupiters where things cost four to seven or, or more dollars each. Some of that's marketing, some of that's smaller production, great demand, so they charge what they charge. And if you want to use Jupiters, if you want to use Synergy, there's nothing wrong with that. They're very similar in construction in some ways to the originals and those those amps. I usually use the Mallory 18, uh, MKT, not the Mallory, sorry, the Vichy MKT 1813s. I like the way they sound. They're very consistent. They are, physic they are visually attractive. Um, they have a well-marked, consistently marked outer foil for places where that matters. And what I really like is they have a relatively low mass body and they have uh, thicker leads in proportion to the body than other caps, so they don't vibrate. There's a lot. I don't worry that the the, uh, the lead is going to be stressed where it joins the the cap over time. I find that I get very solid, reliable results with that. I know I've gone on and on about this, but I get asked this question a lot. I've thought about this a lot. So if you're using Jupiters, if you're using Sozos, I'm not saying you're wrong. If you're using orange drops in an in a in a amp that designed for axials, I'm not saying you're wrong or that you shouldn't like the sound that you're getting. I'm saying that it is not the op the optimal approach. Um, at the end of the day, take all that I just said and remember that hey, use as high a voltage rated cap as you can. So 630 over 400 anytime you can. Just one less thing to go wrong. We'll probably revisit this over the decades. <laughs> no rocks. Uh, speaking truth to power amps, maybe maybe that will be one of the options if I ever, ever get organized and do T-shirts. But I think I could probably come up with a better slogan than that.
Hey, Edward. Uh, heat waves just hot, you know. Um, I think that the heat wave is uh, a little less noticeable in Memphis and I'm sure in New Orleans and, and, and um, Houston than it is in other parts of the country. Um, I see all the reports of this awful heat wave and it's like, oh, everyone's finally getting my weather. So this is kind of what we always get here. We're pretty low elevation here in Memphis compared to Oak Ridge. But, uh, oh, yeah, you had half the town lose power. That's that's not – when it's this hot and you lose power, That oh, that's, that's terrible. I'm sorry. I'm not making light. I hope that you and yours and everyone you know as well. But, yeah, when it gets that hot and the grid gets that stressed, bad things can happen. Uh, so I'm not belittling the situation, but – uh, the heat wave in Memphis has not been that noticeable by me because it's July in Memphis and it's always hot. If it gets worse, you'll know because I'll die. Hey, Joe Rosales. He has a PV Bravo 112 and the spring reverb got damaged. How hard will it be to replace the spring reverb, reverb on it? Usually not that difficult if you can find the tank that the PV Bravo 12, 112 used. I think that's one of the, just one of the standard E-series for solid states. Don't quote me on that without looking at my notes. Most reverb tanks, the bag is held in place by two or more uh, Phillips head screws. You remove those screws, you might have to wrestle with the rear panel uh, or wrestle it out with this, where the speaker is, but inside that bag, you have a reverb tank. It's held on by two RCA connectors, just like a stereo. So most people with a number two uh, screwdriver can change out a reverb tank. It's not difficult. It's just like hooking up an old stereo component. Uh, the issue is making sure you get the right one, um, but I'm sure that you can look up PV Bravo 112 replacement reverb tank and get, get the right part number. Uh, hey, Jerome de Jong. No, I've never worked on a DT25. Sorry. Um, I've had very few line sixes come in on the bench because most of them, when they die, they die hard. Die hard. Um, so they're not fixable or economically fixable. Um, I've had a couple of spiders come in where I, I was able to give the kid a few more years of life. But one, one electrolytic blew up and it was easily accessed so I changed that out uh, once I had to change one of those rotary sensor things on a I don't remember if it was a spider or what it was um, that was a almost that was a newer amp but they're they're built really poorly um, the main problem with the, uh, the line 6 stuff is that they sell some stuff that was marketed as a Bogner and that stuff is really bad hurts both companies Hey, Yousef, thanks for joining us. Uh, thoughts on Dr. Z Rec and Z Amps in general? They seem to be well built. This is one that I had hoped to get to uh, in the Amps Over a Thousand portion of the uh, talk on Vertex last week, the, uh, the podcast. But we got sucked in, into the, the well of effects loops. So I'm going to take a, uh, uh, the first intermission. We're going to do about a, a seven minute break. And when I come back, I'm going to talk about Dr. Z amps in general and the rec in particular. So I think this would be a good time for everyone to stretch their legs and we'll come back to Yusef's question. Because, yeah, I was disappointed that um, while the effects loop conversation was good to have, we did not get to talk about as many amps in that podcast as I had hoped. So that's what we'll do here.
All right, back to Yusef's question about Dr. Z's. And like I said, I wanted to talk about this the other day, and time got away from me. Um, and uh, as the guest, I didn't want to take the reins of that conversation too much. It's weird being a guest on someone's show, and you get used to being the guy who chooses what to say, what not to say, what to talk about, what not to talk about, and then you're like, okay, I'll just sip my coffee and dance, monkey dance. <laughs> it's making fun of myself. Uh, Mason, if you see this, it was, it was a great experience, and thank you for having me. I'm just making fun of myself and, and uh, how silly our brains can be. Dr. Z's overall are very good amps. Now, I want everyone who watches this to listen because I don't talk in sound bites. I give long, I have long thoughts with supportive clauses. So if you cherry pick what I, I say next, you can hear exactly what you want to hear or you can hear what I'm actually saying. Dr. Z makes really good amps, some of which are better than others. Some of them have serious flaws. This is not because I hate the good doctor. This is not because anyone is incompetent, but not all of the designs are great. Specifically, the models with reverb. Uh, the models with reverb, that there's a Mark I and a Mark II, avoid the Mark I. They weren't done yet. The Mark II fixes a lot of glaring mistakes in the Mark I. Uh, real bad circuit design choices that guarantee uh, high noise floor, that guarantee uh, the reverb behaves differently depending on the master volume. That was all ironed out very well by the Mark IIs. The non-reverb amps, I don't have those problems with. It's specifically the reverb models. And if you get a Dr. Z with reverb, make sure it is the combo version. The heads with reverb, they hum. The tank is too close to the transformers. That's not me being mean. That's not me picking a fight. That's physics. You have to have space between a reverb tank and the transformers. So if you have a Dr. Z Maz 18 or 30 Mark II combo with reverb, fine, great, enjoy it. Now, all that said, all Dr. Z's, in my experience, have some reliability issues. It's odd because in many ways the amps are overbuilt. They never quite got the uh, full mil spec memo where you don't do a full wrap, you do a 270 degree wrap. They'll wrap the things multiple times. So you have things which are uh, bulletproof until something wears out, at which point it becomes a more expensive repair. But they use a relatively thick chassis, good, and they use thick acrylic faceplates. Neither good nor bad, it's just kind of a thing. As a result of this, the pot shafts that they have, the bushings aren't quite long enough to use through the thick chassis at wall and the, and the thick acrylic faceplate and use a tooth lock washer. So they don't have tooth washers. So the input jacks come loose, the output jacks comes, come loose, the pots come loose. These are things that all need to be tightened from time to time on a Dr. Z, and they will vibrate loose over time. That's one of the things that the tooth washer does is give you anti-vibration. Now, when I say things like this, I always get some hairy knuckle dragger saying, well, Joe Walsh uses it, he, Dr. Brad, Brad Paisley uses it. How can they be so bad? Let me explain reality to you. If you're Brad Paisley, if you're Joe Walsh, if you're someone at that level, and you're going on tour, and you've got six Dr. Z amps, before you go on that tour, a guy like me goes through all those amps and retightens everything. And on that tour, every night, they've got a tech. If that starts to act up between shows, that tech fixes it. That does not mean that the problem is not potentially there. When I point out a potential problem to you, especially one that I've observed multiple times, I'm saying, if you own this, if you're considering buying this, look at this, if you find this, fix it, and here's how. That's not this amp is trash, that's this amp is prone to this. I've got a Volkswagen Golf, it's a great car, it's prone to certain things, I look out for them, I take it in for the tune-ups, I take it in for the uh, service stuff. Life is good, but you have to know what you have and what you need to do to accommodate that. That's just reality. And the internet is an uh, unfriendly place to reality sometimes. I don't know why, it's just the way things tend to work. Isn't that fun? Uh, let's see, moving on. Hey Wayne, your Super Reverb just about done.
Wes, that's great. I'm really glad. He's been using a Universal Audio Aux for five years with AC15, old deluxe reverb, and a 2203 100 watt Marshall with zero problems. So that's good. And I've heard from a lot of people who've had zero problems. Like I said, I've heard from some other techs I know in the industry that there might be situations where it can be problematic. I don't know enough to say yay or nay. I'm intrigued by that product. Uh, it might be a great thing for me to have for this channel so I can demo 100 watt amps without blasting the neighbors. Until then, the neighbors will have to suffer. But it's something that I'm going to be researching more. I'm glad that you've had no problems and I hope that um, it's much to do about nothing and that's just fantastic across the board. What's the best way to break in Celestians? Uh, you can use a variac if you want. You just set it real low, real low. Like, I don't think most people have any business doing it, uh, but it's possible. Um, you can use it, hook it up to a signal generator too. Um, I find the best way to break in any speaker is to play it. Um, some people I know go around and manually kind of work the surround. I'd say it's possible to do that well, but it's also possible to, to break a perfectly good speaker doing that. Um, advice that I give has to be what most people can accomplish. There are guys out there who could take, take a speaker and, and break it in just by massaging the the, uh, the cone around the surround just so, but there's also the guy who wouldn't quite get the memo right and stick his thumb through it. So I cannot recommend that on the internet. When I get a new speaker, I like to hear what it sounds like new. Um, and then I like to play the hell out of it. Sometimes that's by playing guitar through it. Sometimes that's by hooking up an old iPod and pumping Beastie Boys Paul Boutique through it for a couple hours. Um, there are various ways to do it. When I got my studio monitors, I did break them in a little ahead of, ahead of time. I hooked them up to pink noise, and I inverted the polarity of the pink noise going to one channel, and I had the speakers facing each other. Uh, so while they were pumping out full volume, full frequency stuff for about eight hours, I barely heard anything, and I was in the room with them. But they were facing each other about an inch away from each other, and same pink noise, one was out of phase. So it had almost perfect cancellation which was a good test of, of how well balanced the speakers were. Hey, Des, thank you very much. Appreciate that. He tried a 2x12 cab after I answered his question. Ari, about two uh, 1x12s versus one 2x12. He likes the mix of a V30 and a V-type. Uh, I've only tried the V-type in the uh, Sur Ombre, I think. It might have, wait, it might be in some of the 68 custom deluxe reverbs as well, in which case it's hard to tell because the amp has so many problems. Um, I've got two in the other room. Uh, I will find out soon. <coughs> the V-Type is okay. <coughs> I don't think I've tried the Neo V-Type. The only Neo speaker I've tried that I had any use for whatsoever was the Neo Creamback, which I thought was very, very good. But the um, many of the other Neos have been not so much the one. Um, uh, but yeah, the, v, the V30 and V-Type, I can see that being a good combination. I'm glad it worked out well for you. Hey, K Major, thanks for joining us. Wayne's also using an Oxbox. He's very careful not to mismatch the output load. Very good. Hey, Kleber P. from Sweden. He has a Laney VC15 combo, and after he's playing on the drive channel a while, he switches back to the clean channel that pops. It's probably not a tube, and it's probably not the relay. It's probably a capacitor in the low-voltage power supply, which is what provides the power to the relay. It's also possible that um, maybe the, the it's also possible that the diode across the Omron coil 
um, has failed or Lanny forgot to put an, uh, a diode across the coil of, of that relay. It's not built into the Omron. It's a, it, you put a diode across that coil typically to, to lessen such things. Um, but given that the way you phrased your question, it seems like if you play on the drive channel a while and then you switch, it pops. Whereas if you just go to drive channel, then back to clean channel, then drive channel, then clean channel, it doesn't. That would make me think that it's a capacitor, which is building up and then a discharging over time. So if I had that behavior, I would look at the um, electrolytic caps primarily in the low voltage supply first. Matthew McGraw ended up with the uh, Swart STR Tremolo after seeing my review. Um, and he thinks it's absolutely superb, and I'm really glad to help you, Matthew. I think it's a phenomenal amp. I wish it were 20 to 30 watts, and I wish I uh, had a watermelon. But, uh, you know, uh, I don't. I almost did a little Rascals reference that wouldn't, date, wouldn't hold up very well these days. But, um, yeah, I think the Swart stuff is great. Um, it is a ex uh, relatively expensive amp by modern standards, but again, when you adjust for inflation, the Swart costs less today than a VibroChamp did in 1964. So it's, is it really that expensive, or have we just become used to things costing much, much less than they ever did before? Um, and there's a reason for that, because as you pay less and less, you get less and less. So when you pay a little bit more for the Swart, you get a lot more. Yeah, and there's 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 your plug for today, Swart. Where's my check? Thanks, Noah. Appreciate that, man. Let's see. Hey, Nick. Uh, he worked with. He went to a new tech because he wanted to patronize a shop. Then he and then he and the other tech have been criticizing each other's work on my app. It, yeah, it's not a good spot for you to be in. Um, from where I'm sitting, I don't know if either is right. It's a it's a tricky thing to do. There are techs in this town whose amp who, who I have followed um, of varying degrees of skill. Uh, two of the guys that I have fo I follow quite a lot did quite excellent work, and some of the guys have done not so great work. And when I run into things like that, uh, if I find something that's not quite excellent done by a local tech, and it's a problem, I will say, you know, I, th I see what he tried to do here, and he did exactly what most people would have done here. It just didn't quite do the trick, and maybe he was unaware of this, and here's how we're going to make sure that doesn't happen again. I don't start off by, look at this crap. Who does this? No. I get amps in that have been worked on sometimes in the past by who, who the hell knows who. And at that point, I'll tell the owner, man, this is going to cost more than it should because I've first got to un undo everything some dumb, you know what, did in 1978. Um, so I, I will vent about a terrible text work if it's an anonymous thing that happened in the past. If it's um, local and I know who did it, I won't criticize so much as say, okay, yeah, well, a lot of guys would have done that, but here's what we're going to do instead. So I, you know, there's no perfect way. You can't pretend that all is sunshine and roses, but you can be professional when possible. And if some, something is really bad, if, if something was really bad and unsafe and a local guy did it, the first thing I do is I call that tech and say, dude, stop. And I, I'd have that out with the other tech in person and not drag the client in it if I could avoid it. Fortunately, I've not had that happen locally with any techs. Had, had, uh, there's a couple of uh, musicians, I'll call them that, in this area that I have shared my experiences with, with some other techs, and it's hard for them to get their amps worked on within a 300-mile radius now. But that's a whole other subject.
I am skipping some comments uh, just to kind of get to any questions. Um, hey, Rob F. Yeah, high watts, uh, the DRs, they went through a few, few permutations. And if you, if you buy a DR504, I can make it into any version that you like. Um, um, I'd be delighted to. Um, but first, make we. I want to make sure that, say it's an eighty-two or whatever, seventy-nine, that it, you are hearing the best example of what it was intended to be, at the time, and then you can make a judgment call because a lot of guys. I see this with the silver face, era fender. They have an amp that has problems because it's forty-five years old, and they think that if I blackface it, it'll magically make it perfect. And they've never heard the amp as it was designed. A lot of the times, if I go through a silver face app and I reduce the lead length, you know, recap it, get any conductive wax off there, shorten leads here and there, clean up the spaghetti, which I would have to do to blackface it anyway, fix the, uh, the cathode issue on the reverb driver, remove the, the partial cathode bias uh, resistors from the, from the um, um, uh, pin eight on the output tubes if necessary. Maybe ditch some of the little snubber caps they put in there because they had so much wire. Let let the owner really hear what a seventy six super reverb is. A lot of times that's a really good sounding amp, even if it's not, you know, an AB seven sixty three from nineteen sixty six. You know, but just taking a, a seventy silver face amp with a three thirty k grid leaks. On the uh, on the phase inverter and changing that 10 nanofarad cap coming into it to a 3.3 nanofarad cap magically transforms the, the amp. Magical. It's science. It's not. There's not. There's no magic. Sorry. But um, so yeah, if you have a, a late, late 70s, early 80s high watt, I could I could make it any variation on on the 504 you you want. But I would want to make sure that uh, you had heard it at its best as it's originally intended before I made any changes. Um, I would hate for all the high watts in the world to be altered to be 1972 just because it was that year's fad on the gear page. And I'm not saying that's what how your brain works or that you're uh, guilty of that, but I've seen weird things come and go in popularity on the internet. Hey, Chris R. I am not familiar with the Laney AOR 30 combo, so I cannot tell you whether it's junk. I will say categorically. It's not really worth modding. Um, upgrades to those amps, I, without looking at it, I can't tell you, but in general, there are things you can do on anything. If it's a Marshall style amp, uh, make sure it's got adequate screen grid resistors. Um, you know, that's not really a mod so much as just reliability thing. I wouldn't put too much money into it either way. I wouldn't worry about uh, upgrading it or modding it in the slightest. Um, if you've already got a fade in there, that's a gr great sounding speaker. And a cream back and, a, and an 800 style amp is not necessarily the best choice. If you're happy with it with, with the fade, that's great. If you're not thrilled with it with a Fain, I don't think the Fain's the, necessarily the problem, and the cream back will give you a magical solution. But before you buy anything, find someone who's got a cream back and, and ask if you can play your amp through it to hear what it sounds like. Um, nothing I say, nothing you read, will ever tell you as much about what a speaker sounds and feels like as playing through the, and, and listening to the speaker. So do that before you spend any of your money. Hey, Connor, I have no experience with third power amps. Um, I'm looking forward to eventually getting one to come in so I can look inside it. It's probably a good vote um, in their favor that I've not had any come in for repair yet. Um, nothing is perfect, but um, you know, some apps come in all the time, and some brands I rarely see. And uh, third power so far as an app, I have not seen at all. Same for Rev. Um, eventually they will because people here will have them and they'll need service at which point I will have an opinion but I've heard good things and I hope 
that uh, when I do have experience with one, all those good things are borne out. I just want you guys who've been bagging on Starbucks, I just want you to know I'm down for that. Uh, maybe we'll do an entire episode ragging on Starbucks on how bad they are someday. Um, so, you know, I see you. You are seen. Thanks, Richard. Appreciate that. Uh, he, he likes the short, simple solution episodes. Well, um, I didn't have much choice on, the, on that um Freeman BE50, but to do a short one because uh, the owner had driven six hours or so to get here and he had to go back this afternoon. So I said, hey, there's some good restaurants a mile that way and there's the Stacks Museum uh, two miles that way. And if you go do either or both, your amp will be ready for you when you come back. So I, I, I figured I'd had about two hours to fix that. I fixed it about an hour and a half, which meant that I, I knew I was not going to be able to move the camera or adjust the lighting or anything. I just, here we go. And I didn't show everything I did because it would have slowed things down because you couldn't see what I was doing because I had to be there. So as long as you watch videos like that in the spirit with which they're intended, I usually try to show everything as much as possible. Um, sometimes I'll realize I have shown this one thing in 500 videos. So I'm going to skip ahead a bit and get to the next little nugget people might need to know. But every once in a while, I like to do a long format blow by blow, so to speak. For those who are newer to the channel, it might be the first in-depth uh, video that they've seen. Uh, all right, now we're to the, uh, now we're to the one by 12. All right, 60s and 70s garage. He's matching to a 66 AB763 style head from a boutique Cleveland amp builder. Well, number one, ask that builder what cabs he recommends. Because if you're building heads, if you're building amps, odds are, you have already uh, explored a lot of options. Someone's making uh, those head cabs for him, and he probably offers them in combos. Uh, see what he recommends. Uh, the Mo uh, the um, Mojo Tone cabs are great. There was another cabinet company I used. I don't recall the name. It's in my vi video somewhere. Uh, if you search cab, it'll come up. Um, it was one of the things I tried on the internet. It was a deluxe reverb, but I think uh, needed a new cabinet. And uh, it was one of those things, the whole thing was like 250, 280. Uh, and it was good quality, Pine and Tolex and all that stuff. But um, if I had a 1x12 cab to go generic garage band, I would go with a, um, I would go to, with a Veteran 30 or a uh, ET65 from Warehouse because it'll have enough of the traditional fender cleans, but it'll, it'll, it won't have that brittleness if you're hitting with overdrive pedals. It won't get harsh, and it'll handle everything that a, a 6v6 AB763 style head can throw at it. And I would put it in, uh, for that style of music, um, I would get the highest quality 1x12 I could afford. I'd want it open back, and I'd want it relatively deep. Um, like 11 inches or more deep. Um, I'd want, the deeper a, a cabinet is, the more low end it can develop. And a narrower, a shallow, more shallow 1x12 can get real midi because it doesn't develop the low end. It's interesting how speakers sound um, is determined by the, the plane that they're mounted on and the volume surrounding them, et cetera, et cetera. That's a really long conversation that, I would find fascinating. I'll, I have it in my head sometimes as I go to sleep at night. The rest of you would go to sleep right here, so we'll skip ahead a bit. But yeah, uh, contact the, the builder of the amp and see what he recommends to pair well with it. Hey, Victor, thanks for joining us. Hey, Breeze 3003. Vintage PV amps. Um, by the classic to me, like the classic 2x12 or the later classic 50 and classic 30. Uh, they're good amps. They're not excellent amps. They're, they are very good amps. The trouble with a lot of those PVs is um, if you have a pot that goes out, the pots that they use were very specific. 
And that can be on the mace, that can be on the deuce, that can be the spider mount pots on a classic series. And PV's parts department is being shut down, and no one else ever used those pots or has stocked them. So it can be it can be difficult to get parts. And on the the mace and such, the stuff with the phaser, or this or the stuff that was a solid state pre and a power and a two power amp. Um, a lot of the chips haven't been made in a long time, and again, the PV parts department is gone. No one else has those chips, or uh, you'd have to buy an awful lot and hope that they're not. Um, fakes on eBay, you know, Chinese fakes, uh, and then find the ones that work. So they are good apps whose time seems to, you know, it's their sunsetting. Uh, that does not mean that they're not great. I had restored a mace for a guy about a year ago. And it was, it was fantastic for all, if you want to do seventies yacht rock with that phaser, man, it was, it was the thing. But um, no PV has ever been as reliable as 60s or 70s fender. Now, 70s fenders, the two things you need to look at at 70s fender, three things, three, sir. Uh, it's about 72, they switched from having a screwed-on baffle with cleats to a, a glued-in dadoed baffle. Those baffles, if something goes wrong, it's harder to replace. you got to cut it out, flush cut it to the cab, put in cleats, and put in the old-style baffle. About 73, they started heavily wax coating the boards. 73, that wax needs to be removed in a lot of cases because it traps uh, contaminants over the decades and becomes conductive itself. And then in the later 70s, I'm not sure the precise year, uh, and maybe different models changed at different times, they went from having a, uh, a baffle that had the grill cloth on it to having a baffle and then a frame uh, with the grill cloth on that, and that frame was just uh, Velcroed, industrial Velcroed to the actual baffle. And uh, uh, in the smaller amps, you lose cabinet depth as a result, and that frame always warps and it, it buzzes because the Velcro comes loose. It's, it, it's just generally uh, crappy quality. And also the silver panels, people always manage to lose the, the big flat wa dress washer that would go underneath the, uh, the uh, uh, pilot light jewel, and it's knurling and once that nut is lost that front flap of the panel just likes to flap out and get bent they're weird weird cost say, uh, cutting things that they did but they're still very good amps but if a uh, fender before 73 is always been a much better amp than any pv so i wouldn't call pv a, a true classic but can be very good choices just know that they are sunsetting Hey, Ian Ginzel, I answer this a lot in a lot of chats, and I, I, I don't mind, but I um, uh, talked about this pretty well on Tone Talk with, with Dave Friedman. We talked about this pretty well uh, about three live streams ago. Start with pedals where you won't get electrocuted. Learn how to make a simple fuzz face. Make three that work. Then go make a tube driver that works, not a tube driver, a tube screamer that works. Then figure out how a tube screamer works. You know, Why does it get louder when I do this? What frequencies are affected by what? How does the tone stack work? What is this buffer thing? You need to know the ins and outs of everything that you see in that schematic and how it works. And build up your soldering and construction techniques and see how things are put together and get all that made on a very small, safe, nine volt scale before you approach a tube amp. Um, once you do that, you're gonna have much better troubleshooting and soldering skills. And then go make a whole bunch of pedals, not pedals, a whole bunch of cables. If you can make a, a XLR and quarter inch cables that I would not reject, you know, you, you will have learned a lot and that sounds simple, right? Everyone can solder. Everyone thinks they can solder. Uh, nine times out of ten, I get a, a cable in that someone made, and I'm like, oh, oh, oh no. This, this won't do. It's not that it's... It doesn't require genius to do it right. But if someone has never been shown the right way to do it, 
and all the wrong ways seem to work at first, how do they know they're doing it the wrong way? It, it holds up most of the time until you're on stage in front of a bunch of people. Uh, yeah, I've seen the insides of doubles, double amps, and I've worked on a, I've worked on, um, a lot of high-end double homages, and I've seen the insides of the real ones, and I've, I've had actual, honest-to-God, train wrecks here. There's no mojo. Uh, it's a good sounding app made by a secretive, kind of odd individual who liked to goop things. And ha I talked about this at length, I think, in last week's or the week before live stream. It just happened to get, be played by Robin Ford and Larry Carlton and all those guys. And so, and who happened to be on the albums that everyone was buying in those years. And so, the, you know. The, the tide came in and lifted all boats, and that boat is an odd one, and um, they are ascribed magical powers. I'm trying to th th be diplomatic. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the Dumble, but you know, um, I saw that video on Vertex's channel the other day, the most affordable dumbbell you could get, and it was a modified Vibrolux and it started at, like $40,000. That's insane. That's nuts. There was nothing in that amp that I could not do for $300 to any Vibrolux. For most of it, I would say, no, don't do that to an old Vibrolux to get a different amp. There's no magic to it. He's doing re repeatable, predictable things. He's a good circuit designer. Um, I, I, just, I just find the cult aspect bizarre uh robin ford would sound just as good uh through a 66 super reverb through a 59 baseman as he ever did through a dumble um you know it's it's the player man a good amp lets the player realize the sound and they don't have to necessarily think about the amp on stage behind them they don't have to think oh but, uh before the next song, I need to turn down the reverb, or maybe maybe right before the next chorus, I need to bump up the treble a little bit. They, they dial in a sound, and it's just a good sound, and it responds well, and everything at that point's in your picking and your finger picking and what pickup you're on and where on the string you're playing, and you don't have to think about the box. And Dumbles do that, um, but so do a lot of other apps. But Robin Ford gets a Dumble. He might have had an old basement before that that needed work. I don't know. And so in comparison, that Dumble's great. So he switches to the Dumble and he goes and plays because he's freaking Robert and Ford. Lawyer Carlton did the same thing. I don't think Carlton uses them anymore. His most famous playing was all the Steely Dan stuff done on a, a 5e3 uh, Deluxe, Tweed Deluxe, not the Dumble. Um, unfortunately, those things are crazy overpriced now, but not Dumble level. So there's hope for us more, mere mortals. Anyway, um, to sum it up, I've got a really nice 335 here. I'm surrounded by great amps. I've had, if I had, a, if I had dumbbells here, I still wouldn't sound like Larry Carl Carlton, no matter that I had all the gear. Because I don't have this stuff in here. Yeah, um, well, I think uh, I think given what's in a, a, a 69 champ, it should be about a $500 amp these days. And someone should be making them. I've, I've had this conversation with Brad and other techs, and like, if you look at a champ or a vibro champ, there is absolutely no reason that that not, cannot be on the market today for $500. None. Now, the committee's going to say, well, it needs an overdrive channel, or it needs a reverb, or it needs an effects loop. Nope. Tried, true, tested. $500 out the door. Uh, $600, we have a version with a 10-inch speaker. Done. But no one's making that. Um, thing is, to get that level at that price point, that simply... You need some of the big pockets, and, and Fender and Marshall are 
running in other directions. Um, Vox is weird in that uh, starting with the, the AC15 Custom C1 and going up, they get they start good there and they get great. But everything below there, the, the 10 uh, and the 4, uh, are garbage, uh, garbage amps. They're insulting to that uh, four or five hundred dollar price point. Meanwhile, the guys um, at Line Six with the Catalyst and the guys at Boss with a Katana are like, "Okay, our market," and they deserve it because you can get a Katana for three hundred dollars. It does infinitely more than any champ ever did. So there's a little, maybe that's why people aren't making a four hundred dollar champ because no one would on the market would buy the four hundred dollar champ when they can buy the three hundred dollar Katana. Uh, champs are good. But they're not all that. You know, this 64 AC4 sounds good. Doesn't sound phenomenal. That's not, that's not the reason Vox was famous. That AC4 was a practice app. It still is. Hey, Tom from Kansas. Hey, David Morgan. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Dustin. Any thoughts on the tonal impact of ba baffle thickness? Uh, that's that is you know it is so subjective um, because you, as soon as you introduce solid wood into it, there are too many variables. Um, birch ply or MDF is going to be much more consistent, so you can form an opinion on that. Once you get into pine, one pine cab may sound okay, the next pine cab sounds terrible, the next pine cab sounds amazing. And same thing when if you do pine cab and uh, birch ply baffle. Uh, sometimes it sounds fantastic, sometimes it doesn't. It's like, it's literally the same thing as a guitar body. So this, this one resonates and this one's a dud. In general, when it comes to fenders, I like a pine cabinet and a, uh, a good ply baffle. And I like a nice thick ply baffle. Um, at least five eighths typically. I want it to hold up to everything. And if I have control over Judgment Day, it's not going to have those terrible reverse screws um, coming through that hold the speaker on. I want I want some T nuts in there or something even better. Maybe some some inserts from the other side for machine screws. But uh, I'm weird that way. It's hard to predict though. Anything involving solid wood like pine, it's Unless you're to go and tone tap each piece, in which case then we'd have cork sniffery galore and prices would rise even more. Hey, Paulo, thank you for joining us from Brazil. I'm glad you're here. The most innovative stuff, that's a tricky one. Tube amp technology is the technology of the 40s through the 60s for the most part. You know, tube amp technology at its peak is the stuff that got us to the moon. The world's moved on a little bit past then as far as innovation. So I don't see a lot of innovation in tube amps. There's, there's some, like the, the PT100 and the PT15 um, that Sir makes, which has the IR, the impulse, response, impulse responses built in. That's pretty cool stuff. Thank you, Lev. And that's a very good implementation of very modern technology into a very old technology, which is, which is the tube amp. My friend Jai said, Ed Fist, Ed Fist has got the, the Alta, his big 100 watt amp with MIDI, um, which is not a new thing um, for those of us who are in the late 80s and 90s, but it is a um, implementing MIDI with more with higher quality tube stuff than we would often find in the 80s stuff. So that's not really innovation so much as a good presentation of existing modern stuff. Um, I like some of the stuff that George Metropolis is doing with all the switches and you can get this sound and this sound and that sound. But there's always the, the, the trouble of option paralysis with any of that stuff. And that's not a criticism. George knows exactly what I'm talking about if he sees this. There's not a lot of innovation in tube apps. 
and uh, then I'll see uh, that Tim guy from Porphyria, and it's all digital stuff. I don't know whether he's using fractals. I don't know whether he's using Kemper's. That's really innovative stuff. The trouble is, once you to get the um, the digital stuff that really sounds good costs a lot more than most people are willing to spend. And so their experience with digital stuff tends to be the lower end stuff. And there's nothing wrong uh, with the Catalyst or Katana or the Katana artist. There's nothing wrong with them. They are what they are. The Boss uh, has some higher priced ones like in the $900 range and then the Fender's got the Tone Master nonsense. Those aren't really innovative or they are, uh, a Katana represents innovation of 10 years ago. The real interesting stuff starts with the Line 6 uh, HG Stomp and the Helix, and then it goes up into the Fractals and the Kempers and all that stuff. But all of that requires you to then be able to hear it and how, be able to program it. So you can't just have the unit. You have to have the unit and a very nice computer. You have to have to clean power amp. You have to have um, probably a very neutral-sounding, loud, clean uh, power powered monitors or power amp and monitors. So to, to approach the real innovative end of things has been cost prohibitive for most players. At the same time, there's such a reticence about trying the new stuff uh, if you are coming from tube amps because nothing can replace my, 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 my tube amp. And it doesn't have to replace it. Um, but I, I, I see how the world works. And we already had a, a terrible tube shortage in 2020 between COVID and, and Putin being a jackass. Um, um, the f- supply of tubes is unreliable and it is finite uh, not yet but it will be and Fender and Marshall and all these companies are looking to what they're going to do afterwards and that's how you get the, the big push for the, for the Tone Masters the Universal Audio stuff is um, the dreams and the stuff, the plugins that they make that's that's the real thing. Um, the uh, the digital amp of the future will not be a Fender Tone Master. It's going to be more like the Universal Audio Apollo Two, with all these plugins. You can load whatever amp you want in there, uh, with all the processing built into it. So there's no l- latency, and you and it can either go into your computer for recording, or it can go straight out to. Uh, monitors or just go to your in-ears and then to, to the PA system. Who knows, in 30 years, maybe the entire audience will have it be issued uh, 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 something to scan and it just all gets beamed in, into their earphone, earphones. We won't have to have huge columns of everything and, you know, uh, of speakers everywhere and the volumes issues. I don't know how this world's going to go, but it, it's getting the innovation which is going to make the next Beatle happen. The, you know, when the next Beatles happens, it's not going to be through a Vox. The next thing that just changes how people think of is music, what the popular music of the time is, the zeitgeist. That zeitgeist is not going to involve grill cloth. Um, I, I look at Universal Audio, I look at uh, Fractal, and I see that's how it's going to go. And they'll have baby versions like the Dream and the Ruby that, are already out. Those are the baby versions of the, f- of the future, and the Tone Master is the last dying grasp, and the Katana is like the best realization of the modeling amp concept that we've already had in the years past, um, with all the all the Line Six Spiders and stuff. Uh, uh, I'm gonna put away my crystal ball, but I'm going to be right, and it's gonna be tricky for me doing what I do for a living but I'm going to be right. I also know how to program. Hey, Luciana. Um, your tremolo tick goes away when you turn the master volume up. Okay, yeah, you've got a 75. It's got the master volume, and the wires going to that master volume are routed right by the tremolo speed and intensity pots. So the best way to fix that is uh, to discharge your amplifier safely. And you can see a video on how to do that on my channel, or you can Google that. There's lots of videos on that. And either you or someone who's qualified open your amp and remove the chassis. And the wire, there are two wires going to and from the master volume pot. 
they are routed right next to the wires going to and from the speed and intensity pots, you want to physically move them away from those pots, from this, from the vibrato stuff. And it can be as little as half an inch, though the more you can move them, the better. Sometimes that means that the old wires to and from the master volume should be replaced with newer ones that, that your tech can dress farther away from everything. But that's just some noise um, uh, being radiated from, from the leads of the tremolo stuff that's being picked up by the master volume wires. And it, the easiest fix is just to increase the physical distance between them. It could be as simple as moving them a little bit and just uh, zip tying one thing to one thing and the other stuff to another stuff. Uh, but in, unless I had it on my bench here, I, I couldn't go into more depth than that. Uh, it's not it's not a stupid question at all, Robert Israel. He asks, is it possible for a tube to lose gain? Yeah, they lose gain over time. Not always. Some tubes last 50 years. Some tubes last five minutes. Um, most tubes I would expect to last one to five years these days. Um, sometimes you get lucky they go longer. Sometimes they fail within six weeks. Uh, but yeah, they do lose gain. Um, it's... Not that common, but it happens enough that you know if I have an app with low low gain, the first thing I do is I roll tubes, and a lot of times, right there, that may not be the only thing wrong with the app. That was you know the owner rings in because it's it's losing power, and you do that, and then you realize that well now that it's back at full power and everything's being amplified, he can hear the <laughs> that's been building up in the in the background for twenty years. Hey, score of all things, thank you very much. He's restoring an AB-165, and he, uh, he saw my videos where I said, I like the AB-165 preamp with one tweak going into the AA-864 power section. The AA-864 power section is pretty much the same power section you find in every other Cinder, Fender uh, 6L6 amp in the 60s, uh, the AB-763s. It's, it's that power section, and it has the same negative feedback, and it reacts very predictably and has a very uh, low noise floor and has a very nice musical transition from clean to break up. The AB165 baseman uh, power section, they changed the entire thing. They changed the way the, the uh, phase inverter works. They changed the nature of the feedback um, and they added local feedback on the plates of the 6L6s. And all the, this was to reduce distortion, but it does two things. First of all, it gives you a much higher noise floor. I mean, seriously. Secondly, it gives you a relatively awkward transition from clean to dirty. When it happens, it, it kind of fights you, and then it get, it's like you're pushing against the wall, then you get through. Um, I, I, did a I have a video up here showing one with a six a eight six four output section compared to the AB one sixty five output section with the amps otherwise the same, but that was a while ago and I did that on my cell phone. I need to revisit that at some point with higher quality audio. Um, so you, I find that the AA eight six four power section feels better as a player. Does not have the background noise issue that the uh, one sixty five output section has, and. Um, there's no downside to that. It, it, you don't lose any maximum gain. You just get a nicer transition. Um, if you make that change, be aware that you watch the uh, wiring of the output jack because the output jack is wired backwards on the uh, AB165 compared to the AA864. If you look, if you step back and look at the entire phase inverter negative feedback or feedback setup, it'll make sense to you. Um, but uh, that's the only gotcha there. There's some other things with the AB165, like uh, the, uh, the the two nodes, or or, or wait, yeah, the second uh, triode of V3 is fed um, from um, the pre uh, from a less filtered node than the other triode, and I've explained this in other videos. Because they're doing an active mixer through the plates there of the two channels, that can add some noise there. So I always move that to the same note as, as uh, V3A. Move v, V3 
move V3B's plate resistor source to the same source as V3A's plate resistor. And then uh, th those basements uh, have so much gain they can be unstable, especially with the wires running underneath the board they don't see. So be careful uh, with that kind of thing on those. But you, you can address old, you know, like the wire underneath the board sometimes soaks up liquids and stuff. You can get those things really amazing sounding. Uh, but I think the A864 power section really helps a lot, and fenders should have made that. The higher gain preamp from the 165 into the known to be good, quiet, reliable power section of the A864, which is what they use in everything else with 6L6s. We are back to the next hour. We're going to take another seven-minute break or so in about a minute. I'm going to time this right, I think. I just did it wrong. Sorry, I have a, a dive watch, and I don't dive because uh, the watch is rated for 200 meters. And that's great for the watch, but if I'm 200 meters down, that's 660 feet, I, my ears exploded a long time ago, So, and I don't live by the ocean. But I use it for cooking and for timing like this. So I've got this set to seven minutes. So at the top of the hour, we're going to go to a... Uh, to another seven minute intermission. Why is, why is backspace above enter? Well, I've got uh, the backslash and the parallel hash mark between my enter and my backspace, so I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> VHT lead 40. Um, and today is pe people asking questions about VHT day. Uh, we will get back to it soon, but um, VHT, the Fryat VHTs are great. The modern VHTs are to be avoided, and I don't know which era that VHT lead 40 falls into. So we are going to go back to a seven minute intermission, and I will see you guys.
Thrown off by the guitar slipping. Seriously, how does Beato do those things where he's all like... I can't play like this at all. I can barely play anyway. Such a strange little half-assed tremolo in those things. All right, let's get back to the uh, questions and stuff that we do around here. And uh, I, I went back and looked at my first live stream I ever did, and it was uh, terrible, terribly lit. And I had, uh, um, I was using my phone, and I had a uh, step ladder with my iPad propped up on it so I could kind of see what people were saying and now I'm almost professional then I forget how to play guitar in front of however many people are watching it's a good feeling uh, let's see let me try to get through some stuff kind of quickly uh, to make sure that we're caught up and everyone who gets their question asked because I see that I'm only partially through the comments so if I skip yours the answer is I don't know for instance uh, Mike Blue asks do you think the new Marshall Studio will be the same as the old Marshall Studio? I cannot tell you. So I'm going to try to get to uh, the ones that I can answer and try to do like a speed round and get caught up. Uh, Sir Brown, uh, the Sir Ombre is is the choice. That's that's the choice. Nothing else to look at. Um, you know, no offense to Chris Stapleton, but uh, the Sir. Uh, hey, David, I've answered this in a couple of live chats ago. I've answered this in quite a few live chats, and Brad and I are going to be doing a video together which goes more into depth on this. Um, so start with the valvewizard.co.uk. Merlin's got a lot of information up there that'll get you started, and I think he's got a list of references to look at as well from there. Let's see. Um, Rob, be glad to. Send me, send me, send me all your basemen. Send me all your high watt. Hey, Subro. Uh, again, with the the old JMI and a brown box, is worth it to find out where the heater voltage is. So pull pull one of the preamp tubes and set your meter to measure AC and measure from four to nine or, or five to nine, and um, on on the preamp pin socket, and uh, whatever brown box gets you between six and six point three volts there, that's where you should be running it. Just remember that that voltage uh, on the brown box is going to be in relation to whatever voltage is coming into it. So if it's 120 volts coming into it and the brown box is set to this click and it gives you 110 out or 106 out, and then the wall voltage drops, so will the voltage out of the, out of the brown box. If the wall voltage goes up, so will the voltage out of the brown box. So the brown box is great in a perfect world where the wall voltage is always 120. Uh, that's where the Variac has the advantage over the brown box, but the Variac is a much larger, heavier thing. Matt Johnson, uh, I, real, uh, I would love to talk about cooking, but I need to get through other people's questions on this, but I, I do appreciate it very much. Um, uh, see, you're just tempting me to talk about ducks. Uh, I, I, I discovered the joys of... Uh, uh, duck confit in, in Paris and I had it uh, like four meals because it was so good and it takes so long to make here but I need to find how to make it myself because uh, it's cheaper to learn how to make it myself than to fly back to Paris just for that meal though it's tempting um, 
There are so many good alternatives. Depends on what you need it to do, Ben. I think we talked about this um, last live stream. You know, you, a twin is a, is a certain thing, whether that's an old one or a reissue. You can get a, a late seventies or a reissue twin reverb for like seven to nine hundred dollars most of the time because people don't want the big heavy thing. Um, but you know, for some people, a katana is going to do it. For other people, they're going to want that to be just one possible sound. You know, so they get like the the Serapi T100 or the um, um, Friedman BE100, you know, those things have that Fender thing as well. Depends on your price and um, how much you want to, how many trips you want to make to and from the car for your gig and whether you need the full 85 watts. And New York City Geology, it depends on your pr price point. Um, you know, if I were to, you know, if, $500 AC 15 C one all day long. Um, I know a thousand dollars, you know, the, the AC 15 is still a great choice. So it's the AC 30, um, deluxe reverb reissue 65 reissue, uh, above that. Um, it's going to be really hard to beat things like the top hat, things like the, uh, Sir Bella, um, you know, but I don't know what your price point is or how loud you need it to be. But, but based on your previous question about New York City apartments, uh, the AC-15 and the uh, C-1 and the Princeton reverb issue might be great choices unless you have a lot of money, in which case the Swart is beautiful. Um... Deluxe reverb losing gain and suddenly recovering gain with intense static on all channels could just be the tubes. It's possible it's just the tubes. It's more likely that you have a bad connection somewhere, and that could could be um, a solder joint pulling out of the board. Uh, those old boards warp, and the horizontally mounted resistors especially are prone to pulling out. Um, it could be a bad solder joint connecting the board to the brass strip beneath the pots. Those pull out sometimes, and they'll rest in place most of the time. Then you hit a certain note, and it vibrates loose. Those are very common. It could also just be dirty tube sockets. Um, it's probably something relatively minor, um, even if it's a filter cap. Filter caps are easy to change on those old fenders. Um, Leo's genius is not just that he made an app that was good as he sold it to you, but it was designed to be easy to service. And for those of you out there who want to keep all original everything in a Fender, it was designed to be easily serviced because Leo expected you to service it. Teal static, that is a trick question. I'd take the valve state over the origin any day, but I'd rather not have an amp than either one of those. Tone King's tough. Uh, I've got a Sky King back in for blowing rectifiers again. Uh, I've not been impressed with the Sky King, but that is the only current BAD produced uh, Tone King that I've had in. I've had three of them, all with relatively severe, easily avoided issues. So I'm not a fan of that model. I've not had the Tone King Imperial that BAD makes. I've had uh, Tone Kings in the past. Uh, made by Mark Bartell, and they were phenomenal. So Tone King in the Bartell, Bartell days, wonderful. Tone King under BAD, unknown to this, uh, to this reporter, aside from the Sky Kings, which I would urge people to avoid. Well, that's the best thing there is to do in Tupelo, so I, I might have some barbecue after this myself. Uh... I mean, someday when we have more time, I'll, I'll dredge up the old uh, Diaz amp. I, I think it's on the Facebook stuff. I need to put, put that out there. But the Diaz amps that I have had in have been garbage. And I'm sorry to say that. Maybe that, I, I, don't, I'm not, I don't know the full story there. Um, I suspect that as Cesar, Cesar got older and his health began to decline, that stuff was put out bearing his name, made by other people. So I have respect for Cesar Diaz and everything he did for Stevie. 
um, including uh, faking Stevie out on what the tone pots actually did in his amp. So that's a, a story we'll tell another day. But um, if you like that amp, that's awesome. Viber, Viber verbs are good amps. Um, I'm not a big fan of the 90s custom, but if it's been uh, uh, had the suitable upgrades done, that's a good amp. Hey, Matthew uh, D'Alessandro, uh, right after the first break, so right uh, at the one hour, seven minute mark, pretty much on this live stream, if you need to go back, I talked about Dr. Z's and the Stangray is a fine amp. Um, I don't think it's as good as, uh, it's not the same amp as a Vox, it is Vox inspired. But if you like the sound, it is a well-built amp. See my f fuller thoughts on Dr. Z earlier. Do Gooden's t hey, Gooden, he's talking about stereos. So we're still talking about stereos and loudnesses now. Um, I'm trying to catch up. Yusef, I don't have any experience with the new 30-watt uh, SLOs, uh, Soldanos in general. I've only used the old ones. I don't know what BID's uh, making these days. Sorry. Thank you, Gabriel. The DSL 40CR is a favorite of the channel for that price point. Um, the Eminence Alessandros are very good speakers. I've not heard them with that amp. Um, I don't know what amp speakers it has now. Um, I would probably choose the Creamback 65 for Celestian or the uh, ET65 or Veteran 30 from Warehouse, but I've not tried that amp with the Alessandro. Hey, BMBM. BM. Uh, bass amplifiers are tricky, uh, and I don't know what your price range is. If I were looking to buy, to uh, make a bass rig to play out with, I would I would have two options in mind: either a Sansamp PSA one, and maybe a thousand watt uh, power amp um, in a four rack unit head that I would then you know maybe with a power strip and, or a tuner and or a tuner and then r running into whatever cabinets I had. Or I might look at just getting the Aguilar 500 watt little little thing because they sound really good. And from what I can tell, their Class D impl implementation is a step up from other manufacturers. Um, I, I will say this, and I am not a world-class bassist, but I have worked on a lot of world-class bass amps, and I have friends who are world-class bassists. They're really good ones. You set everything to noon, you get the volume dialed in and you play and if you find yourself constantly trying buttons and switches and doodads that may not be the amp for you but it depends on how you play hey joe mcgraw mpeg v2 22 v4s if you want it to break up at lower volumes that's not the amp for you and that's a very nice amp that will, people will cherish so i don't recommend modifying it in the slightest um, it could have a, a post-phase inverter master volume, what's called a Larmar installed without too much intrusiveness. But again, that's a very loud amp um, designed to be very clean. Um, Keith, Richards, <clears throat> Keith Richards was using those and similar model V4s in stadiums in the early 70s. And so a 70s arena is not the same thing as our houses typically. If your house is that size, hire me. I will I will uh, fix your amp, make it perfect for you at any volume, and coat it in fucking gold. But uh, for the rest of us, that may not be the amp for you to use um, in uh, normal human operation operating conditions. Hey, Yitzi. Uh, You should be fine. Yeah, I mean, uh, trying to stuff some caps. I mean, are you trying to put new capacitors in the bodies of old capacitors? Don't do that. Call me about that, Tanner. We'll, we'll talk about that. But if you just want to have some foam underneath a cap, uh, yeah, if, if you don't get any continuity meter, meter um, uh, here, here's the test. Take some of that material and get it wet and then redo the continuity test after it appears to be dry. That'd be the worst case scenario in a very humid situation. 
but you know, if you're just using it to, to keep cap bodies from vibrating and the, the foam's not contacting the leads, you should be fine. Um, but don't stuff new caps into old cap bodies. I'll, I'll tell you why off, off chat. AC15C1 is the exact same circuit for head and combo version. The, the, I think they, um, they wire the output jacks differently. Uh, that's, other than that, it's the same app. Uh, no, box caps have been around at least since the late 70s. Um, uh, and there's nothing wrong with them whatsoever as long as you're choosing the material and the voltage rating and all the other criteria I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the chat. Uh, now, guitar cap, gu caps and tone stacks don't make any difference. Uh, I'll talk about this, and probably we ought to do a dedicated live stream on caps and guitars circuits and 50s and modern wiring, all these things, to just do a thing on that. And I can have graphics ready to throw up and guitars to, to demonstrate the points. Hey, Stormlight Architect. Thoughts on mixing Mesa Power Tube colors, especially for Simoclass amps like a Mark V. Simoclass is marketing. Um, don't worry about Simoclass. That's just um, changing the way the tubes are are. are are biased and how they're operating. Um, the, all the power tube colors are is Mesas don't have any bias adjustment in their amps, and they have a fixed set of conditions. And they they might say, well, this tube's going to pull X current. That will slap a yellow rating on that one. That one's got a gr different current draw. It's going to slap a green one on that. So your output tubes match each other um, left to right. So if you got a 50 watt amp, you're going to have a 6L6 and a 6L6, or a 34 and a 34. If you got a hundred watt amp, you're going to have two thirty fours and two six L sixes, or you know two thirty fours and, and two thirty fours. It's hard to do this here, or uh, two two pairs of six L sixes, or Richard M Nixon. Um, the only thing important there is that all the tubes on the right, whether it's one tube or two, and all the tubes on the left, whether it's one tube or two, are drawing the same amount of current relative to each other. Because if you let's see if I can do this, so if you have one side that's drawing more current, that gets all the heat, and the other side. Uh, it's not going to sound very good. You're going to get hum and extreme conditions. You're going to have failure. So if you have all greens or all yellows or all blues or all grays, you're fine. You're within the safe range. You may prefer the sound of blues to yellows in a particular amp. All that is is that that tube's going to be biased at 33% versus 22% because Mesa criminally uh, underbiases their amps. They're all cold frigid cold be much better if you just had adjustable bias you can use any tube and, and bias it correctly the and you can even have a yellow and a green and a yellow and a green as long as the two sides match each other you don't want to have a gray and a blue and then a yellow and a green because then you're gonna have that imbalance issue i was talking about and this is really difficult because i want to look here but i need to look here and if someone were to walk into your room right now and, and see what you're watching on YouTube, they wonder what the fuck is wrong with the people. And I ask myself that all the time. Hey, Brad. Oh my gosh. Brad might have slept till 5.30 in the morning. What a lazy bum. Hey, another Scotsman there in Tynemouth. Yeah. I need, I, I've, yeah, the Scottish English crossover, all the border. All the border areas. I would I would love to get all all the English and Scotsmen and Irishmen on here and just ask questions about what it's like to live in uh, in and around that history because everything here is still too new and people don't even know what's around here, let alone what happened 300 years ago that you guys are still rec almost recovering from. But. Um, when it comes to the accents on Vera, between all the the rural uh, Northumberland accents and then all the, the Georgies. Uh, Nikki needs more than the subtitles for some of that stuff. Uh, you know, it's, it, I, I know you guys have all seen Hot Fuzz, especially in the UK. Uh, <laughs> they have the 
one old man translating the old other old man for all the, the guys from from London. You know, that's 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 me to, to my wife with some of the stuff coming from your side of the pond, and I, I love it. Yeah. All right. Everyone, uh, the talking about the VH, the DT twenty fives. Yeah, Bogner designed relays fail destroying output stage. Yeah. Um, if Brad says an app's crap, the app is crap. Thanks, Yusef. I appreciate that. Yeah, Edward LaRose, if you're from Baton Rouge, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, everyone else is just now getting our normal summer weather, and everyone's like, oh, the world's going to end. I'm like, make some sweet tea. We'll be all right. Everyone who's got the DT25 uh, VHT stuff, modern VHT stuff, read Brad's comments. He knows, people. He knows. Yeah, okay, good. The Bravo 112, it's a 4EB. That's great, yeah. Um, and it should be a very easy tank to replace in that. Uh, number two screwdriver and and uh, a cup of coffee, you'll be done. Oh, good question here from Alice Dare McWilliam. Um, I don't frequently encounter problems with tube sockets when it comes to modern or newer amps. Older amps, yeah, um, it depends on the brand. Uh, fenders in the 70s, late 70s, had some, some bum sockets, um, but not, not generally. In the older 60s and early 70s, ones tend to be great. Um, some other brands from the 50s and 60s were not so hot. Um, avoid any modern Supro, the ceramic sockets break. I'm not a fan of most ceramic sockets. A lot of them don't really, aren't made to a good tolerance and you can ins install a tube wrong because uh, the opening in the center is too big. Um, I, you know, it, it depends on who, who does, specs all the parts. Like the modern Vox Custom Series that I recommend, they use ceramic sockets, they're quite good. Um, you cannot, of course there are 84s, you can't, there is no center locator. But I've had other, you know, and. and in general, Belton's your friend for modern stuff. If I'm restoring an old 60s amp and the sockets have gone bad, and that can happen from uh, humidity or spills or arcing, there is a phenolic uh, socket uh, that I get from CE Distribution, which is very, very similar to the originals. Um, but in general, I prefer to use Belton in all builds and all restorations, assuming the chassis hole allows for that. Um, but I don't, I don't have tube socket failures fairly uncommon. What is a common problem for me is that the, uh, the Marshalls, mostly in the 70s and 80s, where they riveted the damn sockets to the chassis, those things turn microphonic and, and because the rivets work loose and the whole thing vibrates. And so when those come in, I, I explain to the owner that Marshalls saved the wrong pound and I drill out the rivets and I install... Um, uh, machine screws with nylock nuts and I put in new Belton sockets and it's better than it ever was. Yeah, I, I've seen I, I've seen what Brad's up to on the on that 65 AC30 and he's doing it right. You guys need to check out his channel in general, but that video is going to be a good one for people. Let's see, I'm going to try to skip ahead because I'm still not there and I've got 30 minutes left on this thing. Hey, thank you, Mark II, 1964. I appreciate it. He's got a 64, 60, JT45, 66, 18 watt combo, and a 63 AC15. Uh, I would love to. Yeah, uh, send me an email if you have not already. One of the problems I, I get is that here you're Mark II, 1964, and email you may be John Smith, and um, I get a lot of emails. I get a lot of junk emails. All the spam bots in the world have discovered my email address. And for, I have an over-aggressive spam filter, and it's really hard. If, you're, if your email, for instance, were to say, how much would it cost to do X? 
cost is is a price thing that might trigger the spam bot. Um, so I will look for that. But if you were to put up here, you don't have to put your email address on here. But um, if you've not emailed me, email me at info at sionicaudio.com. Uh, and I'll look for it after this chat. If you have emailed me, pop it up here that you have, and uh, give me the subject or, or some, or, or if your name is Michael, I'll go through all the Michaels and find you. Um, sorry, it's not ideal, but I, anyone answering emails for me would just have to come ask me. Hey, this guy wants to know this. This guy, what about what should I tell this person? I would spend as much time as fast for me to do it, and, I, and I'm too far behind. Yeah, Matt Johnson. Sorry to be, sorry to be so apt. I wish I wish I were talking up my butt, but yeah, it's just the thing. All right, speaker combinations. Hey, static. Um, the C one comes with uh, tubes, and yes, they are Chinese tubes. Um, the problem is not the tubes. The tubes are usually okay. Uh, as installed in the factory. The problem is the amp's been shipped 3,000 miles before you get it. And how many cargo containers and trucks has it been vibrated around in? Uh, so most of the time, the stock tubes are fine, but sometimes they've already taken the brunt. That's one of the reasons they use relatively cheap Chinese tubes in those is because not all the tubes survive the transit. Um, uh, if the amp sounds good, Nothing is microphonic, nothing has static or anything. They're fine. If there's no hum, you know, hum in a cathode bias stamp like that is a sign that the output tubes are mismatched. If everything sounds good, everything is good. And anything else might sound slightly different. No one can say whether that difference is better or worse. So you may need to, def you, you might have the ability to defer even worrying about that until you begin to have a problem. Hey Jeff, uh, no, if you're having your finding yourself having to choose between a deluxe reverb and an AC15, there's no wrong choice, and you're in an enviable position because uh, both of those are great amps. Um, each of them has slight issues you should be aware of. The deluxe reverb reissue has a few more issues than the Vox, but both are very good especially considering what you can get them for used. They're stellar price uh, buys these days. Um, and they're both ultimately classic sounds. And you've heard, if you go through all the videos I have on this channel, you go through my Vox playlist, you go through my Fender playlist, vintage and new productions and reissues and all that, you will find an awful lot of really great players, not myself, sounding awesome through each and all of these because they're good amps. And there's a reason... People talk about Vox and Fender and, and Marshall when Marshall remembers how to Marshall. Uh, it was probably a cap or a solder joint, especially anything that has a regular time to it that's something discharge, charging and discharging. If I had that on the bench, I could probably sort that and fix it pretty easily. When I recommend the DSL 40 CR to people in the Amps Under 1000 video and all that, or the C in the Amps Under 500, it's not that they are world-class bulletproof amps. They're, you're still looking at amps at a certain price point. They are amps that seem to sound very, very good to give a lot of flexibility, and when they do fail, they have been relatively easy to repair with no systemic problems. That does not mean that anyone that anyone buys is going to be perfect. But whatever is wrong with your amp, it should be fixable. I just can't do that from here, sorry. Hey Jeff, if, if you get the DRI reissue, um, brand of components, that's too, um, that's too broad a question. Look at my uh, re play, Fender reissue playlist and you will find plenty of videos on there where I show how to upgrade the reissue series in general. 
Some of them are Princeton, some of them are deluxe reverbs, a lot of them are deluxe reverbs, or the super reverb the, from last week, where the same thing applies to the deluxe reverb, because the circuit's 99% the same. Most of the, of the upgrades I'm making there are for reliability, uh, not tone mods. So look at those videos, uh, and if you have questions, uh, a tech can answer them. Uh, and usually I tell you what I'm doing. The only real components I use in, in to do those mods, uh, I use a couple half watt resistors, carbon films. Um, uh, if I if I change a, a coupling cap on those amps, I like to use the Panasonic ECQ series. And when I move the screen grid resistors to the output tubes, I use the Vichet AC and PC series, three watt, 470 ohms, or five watt, 470 ohms. You can also get those at tubedepot.com without having to go through Mauser or DigiKey or anything more complicated. And they're just sold on Tube Depot's website as three watt, 470 ohm, low mass um, uh, resistors. They're fantastic for, for that. Let's see. I have not modified a Marshall Lead 12. I don't know that, um, given the current value of Marshall Lead 12s, whether I should modify them. There are a lot of things I could do. Uh, the uh, No, we don't change the pots in a solid state circuit because um, other Marshalls or other fenders don't use those value pots. It's a solid state circuit. Everything's totally different about how everything is approached as far as impedances go and what role those pots are playing in the circuit. It's not... It's not, uh, some, you don't want to put in there the, the, the values you'd find in a super lead just because Marshall. Oh, Beambule. Uh, recap it. Uh, make sure all the jacks and pots are soldered. Um, the red, red knob fender stuff, uh, the uh, Vactrols like to fail. Uh, you can get replacements for them. That's the main thing. It's become really slow and inter intermittent switching. It's the back trolls. Um, I'm not a fan of the red knob twins. Um, my advice, honestly, is if it's working at all, sell it and get something that's not going to cost you an arm and a leg down the road to f keep going. Hey, Alain, bonjour. Ça, comment ça va? What's up? Yeah, Soldano, SLO. It is exactly a well-built high-gain amp that sounds like a 5150 because a 5150 is a low-rent, badly-made copy of a Soldano SLO. As Alain from Fluid Audio Group there can tell you, I do not ride a motorcycle because my wife used to ride, ride a motorcycle and she was almost killed. Motorcycles would be awesome if it was not for rain and cars. As cars are, continue to exist and rain seems like a likelihood for the foreseeable future, uh, motorcycles make less sense to me than to others. Um, I'm, watches... Uh, for some reason, I'm, I'm just an anachronist when it comes to things like tube amps and analog stuff. And I'm into, uh, recently, <laughs> overwhelmingly, photography, videography, lighting. I won't be uh, uh, an idiot and say cinematography yet because I'm far from there. Uh, Roger Deakins has nothing to worry about from me. But just getting this shit to look better um, and have it look good to you guys and have everything that I need to show you be very clear without trying too hard and having multicolor lights flashing or or dramatic mood everything or filmic, filmic looks, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just trying to make it look uh, good to you and sound good to you. I'm getting there. But that, that, that has been the big obsession of the last six months for me, uh, of buying a real camera and buying real lights. And the funny thing about that is I bought all the things and it, I, then I had to learn how to use them. It's, you know, it's like giving a beginner uh, that 335 
and uh, that that Tone King behind me, not Tone King, ugh, not a Tone King, ugh, ugh, forgot I said that, top hat behind me, behind the, the box you see is a, is a top hat on the other side of the bench. It doesn't matter if you have the 335 and the, uh, and the, the to uh, top hat if you don't know how to play a G chord. So I bought the camera, I bought the lights, and I'm sitting there going, all right, the pinky goes here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, Chris Quinn, 7273 DR-103s are my favorite era as well. But I'm just saying until he's heard what the 79 was supposed to be, he may not know. Alan uh, loves his th third power, and Alan knows as much about this stuff as I do. Um, uh, PF, I don't have a suggestion for attacking Colorado. Colorado, I, I apologize. In fact, I've had some guys send me their amps from Colorado because they've not been able to find someone. If someone on here is a good tech in Colorado, uh, I'm not trying to say you don't exist. I'm saying people don't seem to know about you. Get your name out there. You know, type away here. Let people know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know whether the Tone King Iron Man is a something made today or whether it was made uh, by Bartell. If it's Bartell, I'd go for it. If it's um, a current Tone King, I would steer away from it myself. I keep getting asked about vintage sounds amps. Um, See my amps under a thousand dollars video, and in the example of the worst amp I've ever seen listed on Reverb, I believe that was Vintage Sounds. If I'm incorrect, I apologize to Vintage Sounds, but check that video and see if that's if that is the same company. In which case, you would know my answer about Vintage Sounds. If that is not the same one, if it's just Vintage something else, I don't remember what it was called. Then I have no experience with Vintage uh, uh, Sounds. Hey, Marcus. Yeah, most of the old Fender stuff shows uh, voltages in various parts of the circuit. <sighs> I say this nicely. I, the second question makes me chuckle. Is there a good book that shows you how to use Ohm's Law with two amps? Um, I chuckle because almost everything that we do when it comes to resistors and, and voltages and and Amp, the amplific DC amplification happening within the amplifier, everything is Ohm's Law. Uh, so every book on tube amps is a book about Ohm's Law. Um, so start with Merlin Blenko's website, valvewizard.co.uk. Read everything on there. See his list of resources, maybe order his books. You will find Ohm's Law come up on page after page after page. So your question is both way too broad, I mean the answer is yes, uh, and not specific enough to, for me to answer you maybe the question you really need to know. So, um, hey Ike, thanks for joining us. Uh, some, apparently someone was asking for recommendations in around Jersey I must have missed that, Mark Vanderlyn. Sorry, but Christopher Sambuco is coming in here. Yeah, and uh, I know uh, Andy Fuchs and his shop do great work. I can I don't know Billy Penn or Chris Davis. Um, no offense to those guys, but I know Andy Fuchs and his shop. So, yes, later seventies started using. Well, actually, they were always par particle board um, um, on the on the baffle. I'm not sure when they changed on the cabinets. But the most recent late 70s one I had, the, the cabinet was still pine. All right, people are still reacting to uh, stuff I said an hour ago. And I, I've got 15 minutes to get to the end. So I'm going to try to get through um, 
I'm not going to be able to answer every question out of my free, but I'm going to try to answer. I'm going to answer all the super chats and try to kind of cherry pick some of the the not the others are unimportant, but you'll, I'm just going to try to get through the the highlights here. Thank you very much, Stormlight Architect. Um, I think I just uh, I think I already answered all the the tube color stuff. Uh, Simon class is. Class A B. Um, a lot of what Mesa gives you is is marketing, um, and unless I had the schematics ready to put up here on screen, I could not really show you what I'm talking about. But when when Mesa has a term that no one else in the industry uses, like simulclass, that that's a marketing term, and uh, it's it's really they don't have any innovative engineering in them. I'm sorry, they don't. Uh, there's nothing in that Mesa that other people have not done before and usually much better. Hey, Emilio Navarre. I started, no, uh, the mid-tone control uh, is only on both channels, on the uh, twin and uh, the, um, um, oh, what's the, the showman? Because that, that's how they designate it as the top of the line. You know, the super would not have the mids on the on the normal channel. The, the um, uh, pro pro uh, not pro the uh, yeah the pro would not have mids on either channel. Just little things that they did to make each model slightly different. They're all the same circuit pretty much, just with different permutations. And that was the permutation that Fender did on the Showman and the Twin. Both channels got a mid spot. Uh, the chat is just talking, is up to me talking about dumbbells. So I'm way woefully behind. Uh, SVT 4001 Glock and Clang, yeah, I had one. It was just horribly built and they offered no support. I would, I would avoid Glock and Clangs, which is a shame because it was extremely expensive and impressive looking. Getting some of the same questions repeated because I didn't answer them quickly enough for people. You know, if 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 you go back and watch this a second time, first of all, what's wrong with you? Uh, second of all, you'll if you watch the if you kind of stay where I am in the chat as I speak, I get I get to it as quickly as I can. But um, yeah, the Superplex, uh, uh, Bent Tom, the Metropolis. George does great stuff. He's a good guy. I like talking to him. Uh, I have no, never any criticism of what George does. When I said that some of his apps offer the uh, potential of option paralysis, that's going to really depend on the uh, on the player as to whether that's a problem or or an asset. Hey, thanks, Tim Quarter. Central North Carolina area. Oh, there's someone I know in, in around there, but I can't remember his name to save my life right now. Um, Brad might know. Um, he's someone we both know from, from a group, but I can't think of his name right now. Um, and I apologize, if, if he sees this, I apologize. Um, I, I don't have anyone I can tell you right now. I'm sorry. Oh, but call the guys at Mojo Tone. They're in North Carolina. Call them and ask them who they rec recommend. They're going to know all the good amp techs around there. All right, people talking about the future and digital versus tube. Some people think I'm wrong. I'm not. <laughs> Matt Johnson, I've never had a, a garnet. Thank you, Colby Jack. Reminds me, I'll put that up there while I'm talking. Oh, okay. that, I didn't mean for that to still be up there. Sorry. Uh, thank you for the likes. I try not to be the smash that like guy, smash that like button guy, because. 
fuck all kinds of that. No one needs that. Every other YouTube channel. But, you know, I don't give you ads every three minutes. Like some others. I don't have everything sponsored by someone else, especially stuff I have no experience of, but they just pay me, so I, I tell you how great it is. Um, uh, open back 2 by 12 um, pretty much anything that you use for a Vox or anything you use for a Marshall. Uh, the train wreck Liverpool is a little bit more than most Voxes, so... Um, Whatever you think would snarl, it can handle the wattage. Um, but yeah, I would, I would go, well, that's an expensive amp, but even if it's not a real one, uh, if, you get the, if, you get, if you've built the amp and it sounds good, borrow a, four, a good sounding 4x12, borrow a good sounding 2x12, see if you have a, a preference for one or the, the other, and then find which flavor is your, is your go-to go-to. Uh, I, I like it with the 2x12, because with the 4x12 it can be a bit too loud. Yeah, GA40s, RVTs can be really good, Chris. Gibsons are weird because this model's great, the next model sucks. This model's great, the next year of that model sucks. Or this particular amp was great, but the one built the next day by the same person on the same bench, uh, they forgot their glasses or something, and it's just not, not an amp that you'd want. So there's just no consistency with old Gibsons compared to Fender. But when you get a good one, they're great. Now that's what I like to see. Less spice and gluten-free cornbread because we're in Seattle. Well, life doesn't have to suck just because you live in Seattle. <laughs> gluten-free cornbread. Man, I'll pray for you. Bless your hearts. But I'm glad you enjoyed it, yeah. But less spice. It was cornbread that wasn't. Mitch, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I, don't, I don't follow football, sorry. Cheers, RJ. Appreciate that. NYC Geology. Yeah, Victorias are really good. Really good. I have uh, nothing bad to say about them. I'm trying to reach, get to the end. George, come back to another live uh, stream and ask that earlier in the stream, and I'll be glad to get into that, but that's like a 10 minute answer and I, I'm not going to have that time today. Very cool, Matthew. Yeah, uh, the non-reverb Dr. Z's are, are much, much better. And thank you for your kind th thoughts beneath that. I'm saying to you, Teal Static. Hey, Randy, on the old Line 6 Spiders, um, they change presets and they change settings based on a control voltage. And as those things get older and older, um, the capacitors in the, in the power supply begin to have issues. And that control voltage can have spikes and uh, fluctuations, which makes all, makes all the chips which react to changes in that 5 watt uh, five volt supply, they think they're being told to change channels or told to uh, turn down the treble or told to turn up the reverb. So they do. It's, it's a ghost in the machine. Sorry. Hey, good. No, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh, pop them up on the screen in a different order from how you read them in real time, unless you're reading them at the time that, you know, if I'm behind the chat. So I get, to one, and if yeah, I think it needs to go on the screen, I put it on the screen, and then get to the next one. Uh, only once or twice have I changed the order. I'll get a super chat, and if I see a super chat, I certainly try to uh, make sure that gets covered. Um, I, I don't have any flag to pop up later. I don't. 
that's way too fancy for me. I, I wish I had that capa- I wish I had someone as a co-pilot, but uh, the last one I had was eight feet tall and smelled like a wet dog. Hey, Chris, good to see you, man. Chris is another great amp tech there in uh, Australia, the guitar amp tech. Let's see. Yeah, yeah. Hot Fuzz. Shaun of the Dead is, is one of the funniest things that ever done by humans. Hot Fuzz is really damn good, if not quite as, but it, it's... When it when it's on, it's so on. Narp. Um, World's End was kind of disappointing. Uh, if it wasn't associated with the first two, you'd think oh, that's a really funny movie, but it's just not quite there. Uh, but if you don't know it, go find Spaced. That was the sitcom that that same group of actors and writers did, uh, kind of as dress rehearsal for Shaun of the Dead. It was a very low budget sitcom they did in England, and it is. Hilarious. Um, done for about 100 bucks per episode, uh, but you cannot pay enough for that kind of talent, and the talent was there. So, where are we next? <laughs> I bet that was a good one. Yeah, uh, Rob says, I saw a UK skit recently, two Scots in a voice-controlled elevator had me rolling. Oh, they've had a real problem, apparently, at Apple coming up with enough uh, different dialects for Siri where, um, you know, usually there's a Siri for each country. There's a Siri for Britain. Here's a Siri for Indi- India. Here's a Siri for uh, US. Here's a Siri for Canada, whatever. They have not been able to find one Siri who can understand all of Scotland or that all of Scotland can understand. So they're, having to, they're trying to decide whether they have like 37 different possible series for different regions of Scotland. For all, as far as all I know, that could all be within one family in Scotland. But yeah, I mean, the, the accents change radically from town to town, from Glen to Glen and over the mountainside. Uh, where's that one? All right. All right. I think we're gonna have to wrap this up. I'm coming up on the third hour, and I'm I'm not I'm not gonna be able to answer the the other questions. To everyone who's asked a question, I will try to get to you next time. To everyone who's had such nice things to say, your checks are in the mail, but you are very much appreciated. Make sure I haven't missed any supers before I go. You know, I, I don't require a super chat to answer a question, which is one of the reasons I answer. It's hard for me to get through them all compared to other channels where people, I see people do this and like every, you know, there's like 80 questions that don't get answered. And then there's a super chat against the answer. So I try to answer all of them. But if there's a super chat, I make sure I do answer it because it'd be more than rude not to. But I try to answer each one as I can. So I think here, three hours in, it would be a good time to wrap this up. I'm looking forward. Hey, James. Yeah, I was saying earlier in the chat, the Sky King is is coming soon. And hopefully we'll get it working again, despite uh, Tone King's best efforts. So everyone have a good one. Look forward to Brad with that 65, uh, 64 AC30 JMI restoration. I know what he's got in the works for you guys. I think you're all going to be... Uh, in, very interested in that. If you like what I do, he just does it shorter and louder. All right. Uh, where's my thing to end all this?